their issues. We're going to discover uh, successful approaches and identify areas where our collective efforts can be strengthened to mitigate adverse impacts in the future. Uh, and as our region undergoes all of this ongoing growth and development, let's remain dedicated to our goals, right? Resilience, sustainability, preserving our water resources and watersheds. With any event uh, like this, we've got to rely on the generosity of a lot of sponsors, which uh, this year, including at our platinum level, EHRA Engineering, Hawes Hill and Associates. At our gold level, Harris County Flood Control District, Harris County Pollution Control, and Tally Landscape Architects. At the silver level, we have Harris County Engineering Department and Port Houston. And we appreciate our education sponsors, Asakura Robinson and GSI Environmental. And I also want to again acknowledge our symposium committee chair, Rebecca Olive, who has led the organizing efforts for this event for many years, the Biopreservation Association staff, who contributes many hours to putting on this program, and to HGAC for providing the online technical assistance for this event, as they have for many years now. Also need to acknowledge the companies and organizations that allow us on the organizing committee to donate our time. These include AECOM, EHRA Engineering, City of Houston Public Works, Harris County Engineering Department, Harris County Public Health, Houston Galveston Area Council, Tally Landscape Architects, and TBG Partners. Remember that this afternoon uh, from 4 to 7 p.m., we are hosting our networking mixer at Riverhouse Houston. We invite everyone who's attending the symposium to join us today. Uh, food and drinks are generously sponsored by EHRA Engineering and Halls Hill and Associates. So uh, please plan to attend. Uh, the food's gonna be delicious. Uh, Riverhouse Houston is located at 65 Hirsch Road in Suite 100 on the east side of downtown, north of I-10. So today, uh, let's begin. We were privileged yesterday to have opening re taped remarks from Mayor Sylvester Turner and Harris County Commissioner Leslie Briones. Today, we're honored to have additional special remarks from another elected official, Harris County Precinct 4 Commissioner Adrian Garcia. Precinct 2 of Harris County, Texas. Hello, everyone. I'm Adrian Garcia, County Commissioner of Precinct 2 of Harris County, Texas. I do apologize that I could not be with you in person, but most definitely I am with you in spirit and like-mindedness. I want to welcome you to the Bayou Preservation Association 2023 Coastal Watershed Symposium. But I would be remiss if I didn't first mention how grateful I am for the great work of the Bayou Preservation Association and all they have done for so many years. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to welcome you here today because the health of bayous and watersheds is critical to our county's past, present, and absolutely our future. Within Precinct 2, we have portions of White Oak, Buffalo, and Braised Bayous, Sims, Halls, Greens, and Carpenters. Then there's the hidden gem of Harris County, and that is Armand Bayou. I would imagine most of you, given your participation in this event, that you're all familiar with Armand Bayou. But if you are not, you are absolutely missing out, and you should come visit as soon as you can. It is the one of the most amazing places in all of Texas. And in Precinct 2, our partners are investing in a big way in the Armand Bayou Nature Center. I'm also very proud of our Revive to Thrive community revitalization efforts. Revive to Thrive is groundbreaking for Harris County Precinct 2. And by groundbreaking, I don't mean a photo op with a shovel because Revive to Thrive aims to improve communities, 
making them more livable without the financial difficulties that come from gentrification. Our bayous and waterways are a key part of the Revive to Thrive initiative. As commissioner, I'm charged with setting the vision for Precinct 2, but it's my staff who makes my wild you-know-what ideas become a reality. Here to tell you more about what we have been doing is just one of Precinct 2's finest, and that is Jorge Bustamante. Jorge is our senior planning manager in our engineering department. He leads the planning group and makes sure that Revive to Thrive and the community's vision is baked into all of our projects. He is a civil engineer with a background in all aspects of the water cycle. Lastly, he is also an urbanist. He rides his e-bike and his motorcycle to get around town. Help me convince him to go to a regular bike and drop that e-bike by the side. <laughs> Thank you all for allowing me to be a part of your event. You're all doing great work for our area and we're so appreciative of all your efforts. Now, without further ado, I bring you Jorge Bustamante. Thank you all. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Jorge Bustamante. Like the commissioner said, uh, I'm very uh, grateful to be here. Um, I do want to mention, um, like commissioner said, my background is uh, actually in environmental engineering. Um, so I have a really soft spot in my heart for the bayous. Um, I am lucky enough to ride my bike to work um, along White Oak and Buffalo. And so every day I get a little bit of uh, a nature in my day and uh, makes it so much better. Uh, more recently, I've been kayaking as well. So, you know, um, I, I, again, I completely align with with the vision um, of, of, um, of Bayou Preservation Association. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, let me show my screen. I did want to touch a little bit on um, our Revive to Thrive um, initiative. Let's see. Okay, there it is. Um, so before I do that, I, I did want to thank um, the board, the sponsors, and especially the staff for the invitation uh, for and putting the event together. This is uh, really amazing, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the second day. Um, so a little bit of a quick uh, introduction to the work we do here at Precinct Two, uh, and I think it it, it ties very well to the to the theme of today's uh, conversation about balancing growth. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, precinct to itself. Um, this is a quick quick map of, of the county and the different precincts. And as you can see here, we have uh, most of the east side, most of the challenges, the more challenging areas um, in the county. Uh, and that includes especially environmental, but also socioeconomic, pipelines, railroads, um, you know, lack of park space, more flooding, all the all the um, watersheds drain drain to our uh, precinct. Most watersheds. So uh, we've been working really hard, and the work is 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 tough, but it's really rewarding. Um, so that's where um, Commissioner Garcia's Revive to Thrive initiative really uh, really shines. And so um, one of the key aspects of Revive to Thrive is. Um, not only revitalizing communities across Precinct 2, but making sure that the way we do that is um, based on community and it's, it's led by the community uh, and it, it meets what the community wants and needs. And so we have um, set up a number of planning efforts, which um, I'm privileged enough to, to run, um, including community plans. Uh, these are just a sample of the, the communities, unincorporated communities, where we have done um, community plans. I do want to acknowledge uh, Jim Webb and his team um, and all the help that, that they have um, provided um, over the years on, on, on our efforts as well. Um, 
We have also um, embarked on a number of park master plans and transportation plans. Um, and again, it's uh, it's a lot of work, but it's it's really groundbreaking uh, and, and radical idea that you know the the work that we do as as a local government should should be based on what the community wants and needs. This was really not um, something that was thought about historically, and so it's it's again a lot of work, but uh, it's very worth the effort. Uh, the commissioner mentioned Arman Bayou, and I did want to, you know, plug in as well. Uh, we have our upcoming uh, Bay Area Pet Bike Safety Plan meeting um, on October 18th, if anyone is in the area and interested. Um, I know it's just a brief introduction. I, I'm happy to talk uh, for hours about uh, the work we do here at Precinct 2, but I also wanted to, again, thank um, BPA and acknowledge our uh, Clear Creek Repair and Corridor Restoration Project, which is in partnership um, with BPA over at Challenger 7. Uh, this is mostly focused about, you know, removing invasive species, creative interpretive signage, and um, really improving habitat that, you know, has water quality benefits, recreational opportunities. So, um, yeah, so with that, uh, I appreciate the invitation and I'll, uh, I'll hand it back over to Chris, Christopher. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you very much. And thanks to Commissioner Garcia as well for his remarks this morning. It's really wonderful to hear him and, and other elected officials recognize the efforts of BPA and all of you as interested citizens in, in engaging, preserving, championing our environmental resources. So uh, thank you once again to everybody at the county. And, and uh, thanks for being here, Jorge. We begin this morning. I'm thrilled to start our conversation uh, or start our day with a conversation with Dr. Andrew Sampson. Uh, as we say in his bio, uh, by the way, all the bios are going to be available in the chat. Um, if you uh, click on that, you'll uh, get a window pop up and you can read everyone's bios for today's speakers. Um, but Andy is, is honestly a true titan of Texas conservation. Uh, among many positions, Andy has served as the executive director of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, and he and I currently serve on the Texas Parks Advisory Committee. Uh, but his impact has been felt through roles in other organizations like the Texas Historical Foundation, uh, National Audubon Society. He has nine books to his credit uh, on Texas natural heritage. His latest uh, is commemorating the 100th anniversary of our state parks. Uh, and that book is about the art of Texas State Parks. It's a beautiful book. Um, his founding of the Meadow Center for Water and the Environment underscores his dedication to water conservation and research. Presently, he is a trustee for the Jacob and Terry Hershey Foundation. Uh, and he was awarded the Terry Hershey Bayou Stewardship Award just last year by the Bioproservation Association. So I want to welcome Andy to uh, this uh, event. We are going to do kind of a uh, fireside chat with Andy right now. And as soon as he gets on screen, we can begin. Um, there good he is. Morning, Chris. Good morning, sir. How are I'm you today? I'm very good, thank you. And I'm honored to be here. I have so many friends uh, on the board and staff of this organization, including yourself, and it's an honor to be with you. Well, thank you so much for that. I uh, I want to begin just with a with a, I called it a softball question because you probably can speak for hours about this, but talk about the genesis uh, of of the Meadow Center. What what came to you? What was the idea and the inspiration behind creating uh, this this wonderful uh, study of our waters? Thank you for that question, Chris. Uh, I served as the executive director of Parks and Wildlife for twelve years, and I made a decision every day that made somebody happy and somebody mad. And it was the mad ones that accumulated. And so I was in a particularly difficult appropriations hearing in 1991. And the pre then president of Texas State University, Jerry Supple, was in the back because he was up that afternoon. And I staggered out of this hearing after being really beat up. And he said, if you ever get tired of this, you can come down to Texas State and work on water. And so that's where it began. And... Uh, I had worked with the university in the restoration of the, the what we then knew as Aquarina Springs. And um, the Parks and Wildlife Department actually uh, restored the building, which was the old Aquarina Springs Inn, and that's now the headquarters of the Meadow Center. Uh, so 
the transformational uh, gift occurred that when the Meadows Foundation decided that water was such a critical issue for Texas that they would essentially endow the center. And it is now one of the only four institutions in the state which carries the Meadows name. That's fantastic. Uh, from <laughs> your vantage point, then, what is the most pressing or open-ended issues that our watersheds face? Uh, how, are, how are you dealing with that uh, at the Meadows Center? You know, probably the most daunting one <clears throat> is a disconnect between the way we manage groundwater and surface water. We treat surface water as a public, a public uh, property, and it's it, you can only use it with permits from the state. But we treat groundwater as private property, and so the disconnect there is continually resulting in uh, uh, number one an inability to manage the water in our watersheds, but number two, continuing stresses on things like environmental flows and flows into our bays and estuaries. Interesting. I hadn't thought of it in that way, but you're correct. That is how uh, the, the state regulates. Well, think about the Blanco River, which starts out in Kendall County, and it flows southeastward toward Hayes County, where Texas State is located, and before it gets to Hayes County, it goes back into the aquifer. It comes out of the ground at Jacobs Well and flows down Cypress Creek into the bio, into, in, back into the Blanco. If you tried to get a water rights permit from the Blanco today, you couldn't get it because it's already overcommitted. But if you want to go up above Jacobs Well and drill a hole in the ground, you can pump just as much of it as your man or woman enough to pump, and it's the same water. And today, Jacob's Well has stopped flowing as a result. Right. We've seen those pictures in that unfortunate situation. Sure. Uh, and so a natural resource has been taken away from the public in that state or, in, you know, in its current state because of what's happening by the public in other areas upstream. <laughs> right. So and on a on a good note, then. Uh, what would be a memorable experience and some observations about our coastal regions uh, as you have witnessed a lot of changes over many decades? Uh, and, and what are the impacts to our areas about the, you know, the way that we have used our water resources over many decades? Well, my most memorable experience is when I worked in Washington, D.C. in the 70s, the state of Texas began to lease uh, tracks for oil and gas off the Texas coast including some tracks uh, off of Matagorda Island. And the secretary called me in, Secretary of Interior, and said, what do you know about this place? Well, it was a base of the Strategic Air Command at the time, and so I, I knew enough to sound intelligent. So he sent me down there, and I arrived on Matagorda in 1972 when a plane load of generals flew in from Vietnam to hunt quail and white-tailed deer. And that's basically what they were doing there. It was a recreation uh, place for the military brass. So I wrote it all up and recommended that the base be closed and become a National Wildlife Refuge. And the secretary agreed with me and made that recommendation to the then Secretary of Defense, James Schlesinger, who was a bird watcher. So we, we thought we had a friend, but they did not respond. And so... Before Christmas in 1972, I leaked the report to the Audubon Society. And within 24 hours, I got a call from 60 Minutes. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm in too deep. But they ran the story over the holidays. And then immediately after the Christmas holidays, I picked up my Washington Post. And there was a full bottom fold photograph of the whooping cranes and quoting the report that I had written. And so I knew that at that point in time, I was doomed. And I lasted about two more months, hit the street, and a wonderful senator from Wisconsin, whose name was William Proxmire, did a congressional investigation based on my report. He con They confirmed my findings. And in October of, of uh, 73, the base was closed, and today it is a National Wildlife Refuge. But it resulted in me coming back to Texas, which, in effect, in 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 the end, was a gift. Absolutely, it was a gift. So we're glad for that. So, 
to the second part of that question, what have you seen and how we're dealing with our watersheds and these issues of water availability and, and cleanliness of water um, over these decades since you've uh, been, been working so hard? We have the finest system of barrier islands and bays and estuaries of any state. No state has more uh, has done a better job of really protecting its barrier islands and its bays, but we're totally remiss in ensuring that continued flows of fresh water reach our bays and estuaries. We 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 passed a law in 2007, which established a procedure for protecting environmental flows, but the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality has never uh, once adopted the, the recommendations of the stakeholder and scientific committees, which were set up to establish environmental flow standards. And that, to me, could ultimately result in some incredibly severe damage to not only aquatic life, to our marshes and watersheds, but all of the resources in the estuaries along the Texas coast. That makes sense. And that kind of leads into another question is, you know, no one agency, no one person can have the effect that's needed to get the, the health of all of our bios and estuaries to where they need to be. So let's talk about interdisciplinary collaboration and the necessity of involving various stakeholders. Can you shed some light on, on how we could do a better job at that and, and how we could, could uh, have more successful conservation efforts? Well, one of the things that I'm really grateful to, to you all for is that you're going to follow me this morning with Jenna Walker, who's the basically the watershed director at the Meadow Center, who, uh, among other things, manages Texas Stream Team. And I think one of the most important things we can do is to continue to recruit and involve citizen scientists up and down the coast to be, basically gather information that could be useful in uh, um, improving the management of our bays and estuaries. Secondly, I think that our political leadership, you know, some of the people involved with managing the coast are elected officials or they're appointed by elected officials. So we have to impress upon our elected leaders that, that these bays and estuaries and water, coastal watersheds are important because, for example, the General Land Office is probably the single most influential agency statewide along the coast. And, and it's conceivable that a, that a GLO uh, commissioner would not consider that in the environment to be important. And so we have to stress on these elected officials that it's important to us as voters. Do you see a lot of, as elected officials run through the, the cycles, the election cycles, and we go from one party to the next, is there a, is there a continual need to re-educate elected officials on all these issues? Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I was Question. concerned about <laughs> because that is that's a yeoman's job for sure. Right. Um, so you had the uh, honor of knowing Terry Hershey pretty well, um, and and she obviously is a founder of numerous organizations, including the Biopreservation Association. Um, talk a little bit about some some memories of Terry uh, and and your friendship with her, especially those that might touch on on preservation, but also what kind of person was Terry? Well, when I prepared to return from Washington D.C. In 1976, I was told by the, a member of the President's Council on Environmental Quality that one of the people in Texas that I needed to meet was Terry Hershey. And so I met her in the late 1970s and worked with her over the years in the Nature Conservancy and other uh, uh, common interests. But I really didn't get to know her. And by the way, she is one of the people most largest in my life. I mean, I, I, I could go on all day about what Terry Hershey and their relationship has meant to me. But we became extremely close when, by surprise, if you will recall, Ann Richards was elected governor. And one of the first things that happened was that within a couple of weeks after the election, uh, one of uh, uh, Governor Richards' primary supporters was an attorney from Beaumont named Walter Humphrey, who got some very poor advice and announced that not only was she going to appoint him to the commission, but he was going to be the chairman. Well, 
looking back, somebody from the Parks and Wildlife Department must have leaked the information that Mr. Humphrey had some game violations, like he'd shot too many geese or something. And so all of a sudden that was on the front page all over the state. And so I get a call from Governor-elect Richards, whom I had never met, and and she asked me to come and see her. At the time, she was a, the state treasurer, and so I went over to her office. She came out and took me into her office. She told me that my daddy had taught me to run a trot line on the Brazos when I was 12 years old, and I like nothing better than to run the Rio Grande and fish for redfish off South Padre Island. And then she says, from everything I know about you, you're doing exactly what I would want you to do. And then she says, but it's come to my attention that some of the staff, meaning Parks and Wildlife, is making trouble for one of my appointees. This is the way this is going to work. I'll stay out of your business and you stay out of mine. I told my wife that night, that's the best meeting I ever had with a supervisor. So fast forward to the first meeting, Governor Richards had appointed Mr. Humphrey, uh, a wonderful man from the Rio Grande Valley named Nacho Garza and Terry Hershey. Well, Terry, as all of us know, was primarily an urban park person. She had absolutely no um, understanding of the whole fish and wildlife side of the agency, managing the seasons and bag limits and all that stuff. Well, in those days, and we're talking 1991, there were no PowerPoints, there were no cell phones. Every newspaper in Texas had an outdoor writer that sat on the front row of our commission meetings. And all day long, biologists would come in from around the state and do things like they would flash up a picture of like 50 dead deer hanging in a processing house in order to show that the harvest in East Texas or somewhere had been good. And so the chairman allowed each one of the commissioners to comment, and Terry was the last one. And she said, I think I'm going to throw up. And the outdoor riders leaped to their feet. They raced out to the pay phones, filed their stories. And the next day, the front page all over the state was Richards appoints anti-hunter to Parks and Wildlife Commission. <laughs> so at this point in time, I get a call directly from Governor Richards, and she says, Andy, what are we going to do about Terry Hershey? I said, Governor, you told me appointing the commissioners was your responsibility. And she laughed, and Terry became one of the most influential commissioners that ever served on that board. And she was she is the person who had the concept of conservation easements implemented on a widespread basis in Texas. At the before Terry got on the board. There were very few easements in our state, but she championed it as a means of protecting private land, where most of our watersheds, uh, recharge areas, and wildlife habitat in Texas are on private property. And so the easement is a critical issue, and we're using it throughout the state today, largely because of the leadership of Terry Hershey. I couldn't, I, yeah, you're right. I could spend all day talking to Terry's story. <laughs> um, so, uh, finally, as as you reflect on what you've accomplished in your life and your career, and, and all the that you have meant to our environment, what would be the legacy that you would want everyone to to know about? What do you want to leave behind for future generations of conservationists, conservationists, and and environmentalists? Well, if you if you think about, although we've made major progress over the past twenty or thirty years. If you look at conditions on the ground and issues like water and others, you can get depressed pretty quickly. And oftentimes when I speak, people will say, well, all the dire statistics that you quote, you know, what can I do? I'm a, I'm a school teacher. I'm an accountant. I'm an attorney. What, what can I do? And what I tell people is no matter what you do in life, you can figure out a way to take a kid and put them in the water take them out and introduce them to nature so that number one, they understand that nature is fun, but number two, they understand that if it's going to be there in the future, they're going to have to take responsibility to take care of it. 
Absolutely. And I, and I think that is a, uh, that is, that's an amazingly wise thing to say because our, our need for preservation starts with those that are young enough to understand those benefits and then it lives with them their entire lives. Right. Yes. I mean, you have, you have illustrated that in, in just the few remarks you've made this morning. And, and so I think the more that we can do to engage uh, young people and and they grow into the senators of the future and the contributors to boards of directors and such. So, and and founding water centers. Exactly. Well, Thank Andy, you. I've enjoyed this so much. Thank you for starting our day off on a, on a wonderful note. I appreciate the conversation and we look to see you uh, again very soon. I look forward to that and good luck with the rest of the day. Thank you for including me. Thank you, sir. So as we move on this morning, uh, Andy did mention that uh, he uh, has asked Jenna Walker, who is director of the Water Services Division of the Meadows Center, to join us this morning. Uh, and she is going to talk about uh, One Water Solutions in Texas, uh, which is a holistic approach to water resource management. Uh, this has a lot to do with all of these record-breaking record -breaking growth, uh, our extreme weather events, uh, and limited resources. We've got to look at programs like the, the One Water Philosophy, which is an intentionally integrated approach to water that promotes the management of all water, right? You know, drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, gray water, it's all one single resource. And so this management approach can help communities to achieve that long-term resiliency that we need uh, and the reliability of water to be able to be uh, used for, for the future. Um, Jenna is uh, online, I believe. There she is. Welcome this morning. Good morning. I will take it away. Yes, share your screen. Say the word. Okay. Let's see. Okay, let's get to the beginning. There we are. Good yep. morning, everyone. Okay, can you see my presentation? You're all good, ready to go, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor to speak to y'all today, especially to follow my greatest conservation hero, Dr. Sansom. And I've heard so many wonderful stories about Terry from him and just feel very honored to be here with you guys. I'm gonna give a brief introduction. I'm glad that you heard um, the background of the Meadow Center from Andy himself and um and was gonna talk about, you know, a and a the definition of one water, but luckily Mayor Turner beat me to that too. He had such a wonderful um speech to kick off the symposium. So I was very impressed and, and thrilled to hear that from him and then Miss Fito to hear about all the wonderful things that Houston is is doing um, geared towards one water. So I won't spend too much time on the definition and then just dive into some of our Meadow Center collaborative efforts. So for those that um, don't know, we are housed at the headwaters of the San Marcos River in San Marcos at Texas State University. And the our vision is um, to ensure that all people understand the value of water and environmental stewardship. And it's it's I, I still pinch myself that I get to work here every day. I've been here for eight years and um, met Andy long before while working at the Capitol, my first job out of college. And um, at that time, he was lobbying for protected places. And I was I was learning all about, you know, issues of Texas and hearing straight from shrimp farmers and rice farmers about the importance of environmental flows. And um, this was during the 79th session. So um, I was learning about groundwater districts and the rulemaking and um, permitting procedures of those districts and also conservation plans. Well, I think that got buried in my brain. And then I shortly thereafter moved to South America. I wanted to explore the world and um, see new places. And so I, I was teaching English in Cuenca, Ecuador. 
Um, coincidentally, Cuenca means watershed in Spanish. And um, it's a beautiful place with four flowing rivers um, going through town. And I, I was surprised to see that the water was fresh out of the tap. You could drink the tap water. But everywhere we traveled in between um, had rainwater cisterns for fresh water, or you know, we had to drink a lot of bottled water. Well, it really helped me realize how lucky I was to be from um, a place in Texas that has clean water coming out of the tap. Later realized how, you know, that's not true for all Texans and, and we're working on that. But um, it led me to pursue a master's in, in environmental geography at Texas State. And uh, one of my first classes was Andy's uh, Parks and Protective Places course. And of course, Terry Hershey was men mentioned. Let's see, I'll trying to advance slides here. So uh, the Meadow Center mission is inspiring research, innovation, and leadership that ensures clean, abundant water for the environment and all humanity. And although, you know, we are, we are housed in San Marcos, we work with partners, hundreds of partners across the state to ensure this mission. And I've seen so many wonderful partners um, on the symposium yesterday and today. So I um, wanna give a shout out, especially to Bayou Preservation Association that we've been working with closely over many years. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those programs. And dive into One Water. So like I said, Dr. Uh, Mayor Turner already gave us that introduction. There are many definitions, but mostly looking at managing water in a holistic way. So seeing all um, types of water as valuable and um, you know, coming from rain, storm water, groundwater, even wastewater, which I think we need a new term for that. There, there are some people that are promoting that. I don't see it as waste necessarily. Recycled water and drinking water. So seeing this as a, a single resource. And it takes a true village to ensure that this type of um, intention is integrated across our, our state. Let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna talk just briefly about the US Water Alliance. They are um, doing an amazing job to lead the charge across the, the country as a national nonprofit, driving the movement, growing a chorus of people, ideas, and action, shifting the center of gravity and water management to more sustainable, integrated, and equitable approaches. So often we, we focus on the tools and techniques to make progress on water, but less attention is paid to the people and their struggles and, and insights and successes. So I really appreciate that um, you can learn from US Water Alliance about um, all aspects of this approach and um, had the privilege of, of attending their US Water Alliance um, conference focused on One Water last year in Milwaukee with some of, I see some familiar faces that were there. And not only were we talking about, you know, um, wastewater management and cleaning water and restoring nature-based infrastructure, but also how water is life and it's sacred and it's healing and it can, it's such an, you know, it, it is such an important part of our, our world, even from you know, before we were born inside of our, our mother's womb. I also was happy to see Yvonne Forrest's um, quote from Houston Water as the director. Um, she is right right on, on spot with envisioning Houston and man the management of the water supply with a one water lens, um, seeing it as a valuable resource and needing to be managed managed holistically. So kudos to her. And, um, you know, as the fourth largest city in the country, I know y'all are really setting the bar high. And so 
very, very happy about that. Okay, for for research, I'm going to talk about the the four pillars that the Meadow Center is is founded upon. Um, conducting solutions focused research is is number one. And we have several research projects um, geared towards one water. We learn, we lead research initiatives for implementing integrated one water management approaches that can help communities achieve long-term resiliency and reliability for the benefit of both the environment and the economy. So in, um, in 2020, the Texas le legislature passed SB 905, which developed a regulatory guidance manual explaining the rules for, um, for direct potable reuse. So this happened in large part as a result of a study that Dr. Mace, our current executive director, and um, a couple of Meadow Center fellows. So we conducted research to examine the regulatory hurdles for implementing one water in Texas. And the bill creates a, a clear path for water providers across, across the state to adopt this important management strategy. And um, we ha also have a lot of students that are working under Dr. Mace's leadership and guidance and, and other um, professors that are associated with the Meadow Center to conduct um, real world research, applied research to solve some of these constraints that we have related to one water, including um, rainwater. So one of, uh, there's a graduate student um, conducting research on rain rainwater harvesting um, firm yields with a focus on how rainwater harvesting can be a reliable supply based on numbers for each regional water planning area. And since, I guess this past year, um, Shield Ranch west of Austin became the first um, public water supply to provide all of their water directly from rainwater. And it's, we're, we're partnering with them, we are cheering them on and hoping to conduct studies on groups such as this that are um, really paving the way for the, for the future for um, incorporating one water into public water supply, not just rainwater harvesting for individual um, users, but also for large buildings and development throughout the state. You know, we've talked a lot about the growth in the state and need to be incorporating these alternative um, approaches immediately. Um, so Andy mentioned that we're also studying groundwater surface water interactions at the Meadow Center. And, and I've had the privilege of, of leading the charge on that on behalf of our team and then um, working with hydrogeologists and specifically a Meadow Center fellow, um, Doug Weirman. And so the, the goal is to gain a better understanding of base flows and the source of springs. Um, and of course this, this does impact environmental flows all the ways to our all the way to our bays. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. We there's a lot of field work in, um, involved with it. You get to know so many wonderful landowners that are wanting to do the right thing and protect their precious resources. And um, you can see a group of our uh, watershed services team here conducting flow or measuring flow and this is the little blanco and you can see here all the all the little dots we start at the headwaters and measure flow all the way down to um, the confluence of the blanco and then do what we call is a game loss study where we're studying where the, the the river is gaining flow and where it might be going underground or losing flow so you can see here the yellow is dry most of the time, then we have a, a gaining reach um, starting up. And then you can see the red is absolutely dry again, where the water's going underground and then pops back up along the way before it meets the, 
the Blanco. So um, this is a part of a picture from one of our landowner contacts and love hearing stories about, you know, their experience on the on the land and with these rivers. And it's it's just such an inspiring part of part of the work, but really um, helping them understand what they can do directly on their property to increase flow and then also um, with that helping larger conservation organizations understand certain parts of the watershed that are more, more vulnerable to um, preventing recharge or giving opportunities for recharge. Okay, I'm gonna move along here. So leadership is a, a large part of what we do as well, transforming knowledge into action. And I know that Jason pinched back with the, um, the let's see, with General Land Office spoke to y'all last year. So I'm not gonna get into this program too deeply today, but wanted to highlight Clean Coast Texas Initiative as a coastal uh, project that we're working directly with the, the land office on and many partners to address um, water quality, to, to work with communities to improve water quality. And it's, um, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm working directly with our coastal coordinator, Dr. Christina Lopez on this project. She is, is leading the charge and um, we couldn't do it without a number of amazing partners as well. So here the purpose is collaborating with coastal communities to achieve their ecological, economic, and public health goals. So um, the Meadow Center is the project manager um, under the general land office, but then as you can see here, we work directly with the Texas Community Watershed Partners, Sea Grant, um, Doucette, Doucette Engineering, and Anchor Engineering to achieve these goals. And let's see, here are some of the services that we provide to coastal communities. And I'm happy to report an update from Jason's introduction last year that we do we have assisted communities with identifying um, um, opportunities for green infrastructure and assisting them with with all types of needs that they have related to improved water quality and protecting water quality. Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna run through the next section fairly fast, but wanna give a shout out again to Bayou Preservation Association for partnering with us on um, Texas Dream Team Riparian Training in Houston that we held recently. And let's see. So with education, encouraging lifelong learning um, through Texas Dream Team, we're helping sit communities and um, just anyone that's interested in getting involved, learning to, see, to, to do what they can to protect the environment. So with our riparian training, it was a partnership with the Nueces River Authority to um, educate the, the community about riparian zones and how they can serve as a natural um, buffer and scrubber cleaner of water and also help with, with um, recharge. So I, I know that a lot of people are familiar with Texas Stream Team, but um, for those that are not, quick intro there. It's a statewide, we've changed the, we've updated the word to community scientists could, because we wanna include all community members. It's a statewide organization of community scientists and partners to, well, specifically test water quality, but we've been starting to open up to um, additional trainings. And it's in partnership with the Environmental Protection Agency and TCEQ. And we, so we receive partial funding from EPA through the Te Texas Commission for Environmental Quality. 
And the riparian evaluation training is a great way for people to start understanding um, these buffer zones and how they work to protect water quality and the rivers. So it's a we we've started in person, but during the pandemic we did incorporate a um, a virtual training as well, and through that have um, you know through show them a lot of pictures instead of getting out into the field. But as you can see here, it's a, a very special part of the river that is working in conjunction with the water to slow down floodwaters and um, dissipate the water and also be cleaning it as it goes, um, storing the water in the land and also can pr provide wonderful habitat. So we worked with Grant Moss at, at BPA to become a trainer. So I know he's going to start leading more riparian trainings in the in the Houston area. And through this training, we we talk with folks about you know these these myths about creeks and rivers. I know through the symposium we've addressed some of that today or and yesterday. Um, just working to maybe. Um, discount some of those myths and help people to understand how floods can be okay if they're not occurring in a you know a high urban zone, um, how droughts can be okay, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see here the um, how just one blade of grass can start catching sediment and slowing down the water. I'm gonna skip ahead pretty quickly um, because of time, but through these actions of the riparian zone, you can see um, the payoffs, improved water quality, improved wa water quantity and habitat, and um, in addition to the aesthetic beauty that it's offering. And again, you can see over time how um, if you let nature do her job, she can restore these systems back to their natural environment. We talk about plants and how they have this amazing um, structure. This spike rush has up to 22 feet of roots that are going to be um, filtering that water and recharging it to the aquifer. This is all based on the field guide for the the remarkable riparian produced by the Nueces River Authority with the leadership of um, another one of my conservation heroes, Sky Louie. So I do have a QR code um, below and I'm gonna check the time. I know I'm kind of running over, so I'm gonna skip ahead. There is the QR code, and I will provide it in the chat um, once I'm finished. So one more thing I want to talk about related to One Water. In Wimberley, um, Dr. Sansa mentioned, you know, that that Jacob's well has, has gone dry again. And so what used to be a, an amazing swimming hole has now become dry. And so we're working with the local community to um, keep the, the Cypress Creek clean, clear, and flowing. And with all of the growth that's occurring, um, working to protect these resources and ensure that we have flows for future generations. So you can see in here a model from 2010, um, what the growth looks like versus two, 2000 or 2100. And I know that's happening across the state. So with a, a an amazing group of partners listed here, um, we heard that the Wimberley Independent School District was um, you know, looking for new properties to build schools. And um, there are lots of concerns about you know, the impacts to the aquifer, to these amazing um, watering holes, and then also um, the, the stormwater impacts to these sensitive systems. So this group, including Texas State and the Meadow Center Watershed Services team, came up with a, an approach 
related to one water. And I'm going to let the second graders of Blue Hole Primary School um, tell you this story before I close. It is so exciting to know all the things that we've done here at Blue Hole, but especially what we're proud of is our one water system. And we have an awesome group of young men and young ladies. Our second grade GT class is going to. explain to you exactly how this system works here at Blue Hole. So excited to see this. Tank in front of Blue Hole Primary holds 10,000 gallons of water. The water in the tank is rainwater. The water in the tank in front of the Blue Hole Primary is used to water the grass and trees in front of the buildings. The gutters are right it over there to bring the water into the tank. This is about our limestone blocks. Our drinking water comes from the underground water. Then how can we start our water supply? Like this. See how it's empty? Proteus and impervious. Proteus allows water to sink in. Impervious uh, um, just rolls off the side. We have pervious and impervious on the side box when you walk in. Now we start again. We pour this water. Oh, in. And on this side, when I pour it, it goes, just runs down. It doesn't sink in. And so that side is called impervious. That's impervious because it just rolls up. And now it sinks in to the aquifer. The vegetative filters get water down storm water. It, it helps allow water to sink in. It also slows down erosion. It stops bad things from, before they go into the groundwater. It also helps with flooding. See how there is not that many cars in the parking lot just like this one? That's because the parking lot is in an angle so the rainwater can go into the grass and sink in. Firefighter supply tank. The, the firefighter supply tank holds more than 200,000 gallons of water. It's big, skinny, and it's tall. It's a sign for the firefighters to know that they can use it. This water is only for firefighters. It feeds the fire hydrants and fire sprinklers. And it has hose connections. This is the final rich supply tank. Low, it is the lower and blacker one. Lower so gravity can help the water get into there, into the tank. And it holds more than 200,000 gallons. And it collects rainwater. And as you can see, there's purple that it's from the purple pipes. Purple pipe is rainwater. Probably just a shout, it's not potable water. Potable water, non potable water means you can't drink it. A blue hole, purple pipe means that it was caught here. Rainwater lands on the 78,000 square feet roof and is also cotton AC condensate and there's 84 AC units. Water stored right over it comes here and then it gets cool. This is the plumbing window. They are all the pipes are color coded to what they mean. Red is hot and potable water. Blue is cold and also part of the water. They are both all the Texas family. Yellow means ventilation. Green is rainwater, which we can also call it dirty water. 
Purple is rainwater and AC condensate, also known as site first of water. No. The principal primary was built with STEM principles in mind. It uses science, technology, engineering, and math to immerse the students in the experience. For instance, this is a rain tube. When it rains, you can see the water entering into the system. This water winds up in the site harvesting supply, and that's what's used for flushing the toilets here. Thank you to the designers. Thank you to the construction worker. Thank you for all the engineers that helped to make the plans and helped to build the school. Thank you, builders. Okay, so I will stop there and hand it back over to Chris. Sorry, I went a little bit over, but hope y'all enjoyed that video. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure everyone did. I'm grinning ear to ear. I've given that presentation and it was nowhere near as effective as those children. That was awesome how much they learned and think about what they're going to be bringing into their futures about their knowledge of, of recharge and watersheds. And that's that is really, really cool. Um, Andy Sampson talked about the importance of freshwater flows to coastal estuaries. Um, real quick, talk about what the biggest impediment might be to re to that recharge. Uh, you know, are we interrupting those flows basically with development? Is that the simple answer? Jenna, you're you're muted. I'm sorry. There we go. Yes, it's a. It's a huge piece of the issue and, um, you know, with our more straws taking out more water, it is, we have hydrogeologists confirming that it is sometimes even a one-to-one -one withdrawal from what would, what would otherwise be coming from our springs and, and going into the rivers. Um, especially in, you know, these, these systems where the shallow aquifers are providing flows through through the springs. Um, another big contri co contribution is the heat dome and you know the extreme weather events that we've been receiving. So when the when the rain event is um, you know 10 inches and moving so fast it doesn't have an opportunity to recharge the aquifer as, as easily. Right. Yeah. Uh, a question from our guests. Uh, you mentioned Senate Bill 409 uh, had a definition for direct potable reuse for municipalities. Is is there anything being done to update the definition for industry use? Um, I don't know. I could I could get back to you on that. I I know that it's a, it's been a slow process, but there you know we're working with TCQ and others to see how you can be permitting these these systems legally um, and paving the way for for others. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but um, you know, I think they're starting to listen and it's we're gaining momentum for sure. So uh, when you first came on uh, the screen, I noticed your background and one of our guests did as well. Uh, everyone's curious what the background is. I assume that's at the at the uh, Meadow Center? Yes. So this is some of the springs at the bottom of Spring Lake that um, are the headwaters of the San Marcos. And so I encourage all of you to come visit us. We have the glass bottom boats where you can peer directly into the aquifer and, and see this for yourself. Yes, I would encourage that as well. Thank you, Jenna, so much. And thank you for teaching us a new Spanish word. I love uh, now knowing what La Cuenca is. Yes, thank you. Thanks for being here today. We appreciate you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take uh, uh, just a quick break, uh, bio break, and we'll be back with our next presenter. Um, while we're gone, there'll be, uh, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead in my schedule. We're ready for Steve. Um, Stephen Johnson, who is principal planner with the uh, Community and Environmental Department at the Houston Galveston Area Council. Uh, we're going to be talking about TMDLs, uh, which is the total maximum daily loads, uh, how those are used in watershed planning. Um, let's hear from Stephen about the breadth of our TMDL projects within the uh, HJC region. There's Stephen. Good morning, sir. Good morning. 
And, and uh, I'm sorry, I tried to put you on a bathroom break, but uh, that'll, be, <laughs> that'll be after your presentation. Welcome. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Chris. It's great to uh, follow Jenna up It's and an understanding that the Meadow Center is trying to figure out what, how to change wastewater in that term, um, specifically since I focus on fecal waste and wastewater uh, in a daily basis. Um, and folks don't understand oftentimes that uh, during droughts, uh, most of the water in our bayous comes from our wastewater inputs. And so changing that term would be uh, a great uh, benefit to our region. Uh, for those that don't know the Houston Galveston Area Council or HJC, it's a 13 county council of government here in Southeast Texas. We work with city and county governments, nonprofits and others using federal and state funds to serve the community and regional planning needs. Uh, planning at HJC covers four broad topics, transportation, public services, human services, and the community and environment of which I'm a part of. Today, I'm going to focus on um, contextualizing the total maximum daily load program within the water quality management efforts of the state of Texas. I'll talk about challenges to uh, watershed based planning, including the total maximum daily loads, as well as opportunities. Looking at total maximum daily loads, um, they come in two parts. There's the first part of the TMDL is the actual setting of the, of the amount of a pollutant that can go into a water body and the water body still meeting state water quality standards. The second part is the implementation plan, the, the, the meat, if you will, of which stakeholders get together and develop that plan to actually address that impairment uh, going forward. And so we'll be talking about that implementation plan in, in most of, the, of today's talk. Determining the need for TMDL starts with the water quality management process, uh, the monitoring, the assessing, and the actual addressing of an impairment. The US EPA, uh, via the Clean Water Act, requires states to monitor their waters and assess those waters to determine if they're meeting state water quality standards. There are water quality standards for public health. Think of drinking water or the fist tissue consumption, contact recreation, uh, in the case of fecal bacteria in waters, and aquatic life, uh, trying to make sure the waters support aquatic life by measuring things like DO or dissolved oxygen, uh, nutrients, chlorophyll A, and habitat. And finally, there's some standards for nuisances such as smells and litter. You might wonder how HJC became involved in the total maximum daily load process. Uh, a lot of it began with uh, uh, the need to uh, gather data. Uh, back in the early 90s, HJC began managing the Clean Rivers program here in our region. And uh, the big takeaway from the slide really is um, that the region is heavily monitored, more so than most other parts of the state or even the nation. Besides the nine uh, partners that are monitoring uh, this region, uh, they cover an area of, of five river, coastal, and, and bay basins, five of those, and a total of 450 uh, monitoring sites covering parameters on a quarterly and sometimes monthly basis, including clarity, temperature, dissolved oxygen, nutrients, bacteria, and flow. All that data is available on HJC's website through its water resource information map, as well as the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality. All that quality assured data can lead to impairments and concerns, and you can find the state's impairment and concerns uh, in a report, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality's Texas Integrated Report, which is produced every two years. Currently, we are in the 2022 Integrated Report. HDAC also produces an annual basin highlights report, and every five years, a basin summary report that contains those impairments and concerns. In addition to bacteria, which you see on this map that covers most of our watershed uh, impacting contact recreation, there are also impairments for aquatic life as well as public health in our region. So once we've identified impairments um, have been a, a, an issue, a final action is to address those impairments is uh, needed. And one of those methods is a watershed-based plan. Uh, Watershed-based planning uh, is that effort to develop a plan with stakeholders on a voluntary basis to produce uh, uh, and reduce uh, pollutant loads, uh, trying to answer those questions of who, what, when, why, and how. There are two types, as, I, as you see on the slide, uh, total maximum daily loads for their development of their implementation plan, and then watershed protection plans 
uh, both seek to, again, reduce uh, pollutant load. TMDLs on one side only focus on one pollutant of concern. Water protection plans, however, can look at a multiple set of pollutants of concern, as well as other issues that stakeholders wish to address uh, in their watershed protection plan. I'll focus mostly on TMDLs today, but note water protection plans follow a similar path with regards to development and execution. You might wonder uh, where we sit in our region with regards to the number of watershed-based plans. Uh, as you can see on this map, um, most of the, the region is covered by some form of a watershed-based plan. Uh, there are 11 total maximum daily load plans in development or in implementation and there are 13 watershed protection plans in development or in, in implementation as well. So there's likely one near you if you wish to get involved in one of those. I'm gonna focus on the bacteria implement, implementation group or BIG as a TMDL project example. Uh, the bacteria implementation group is TCEQ's TMDL project uh, as one of the longest and oldest running. Uh, the TMDL started in 2000 uh, with those uh, TMDL is trying to determine how much of the fecal bacteria can go into the water body. And the implementation plan began in 2008 uh, with the formation of the Bacteria Implementation Group, the, the committee uh, that uh, formed to uh, develop the plan, uh, which was completed in January 2013. Uh, that 33-member organization is a diverse committee of, of city and county, as well as uh, consultants and those nonprofits interested in improving the water quality in our region. We're currently updating that implementation plan uh, and trying to get a, a revised plan looking at things that have happened over the past 10 years. And I'll talk about those in just a second. The Vector Implementation Group, or BIG, is big for a variety of reasons, uh, not necessarily just because of the fecal waste, but certainly the size of the project area. There's 3,260 square miles in the big, uh, about the size of Rhode Island and Delaware combined. It has expanded since 2013. We've added Armand Bayou Watershed in 2015, East and West Fork of San Jacinto River in 2016, and Jarbo Bayou in 2018. The population is greater than 5 million, and there's all of part, all are part of 63 cities and 10 counties in the project area. In addition, there are over 600 wastewater treatment facility permits. Uh, compare that to a similar project up in the Dallas area where there's only four wastewater plants. And so that's certainly an issue for us to be concerned with. Uh, in addition, we have over 130 multi, uh, municipal separate storm sewer system permits in our watershed as well as for uh, about 150,000 on-site sewage facilities or septic tanks uh, in our region. So lots of, of, of big and interesting things to think about as we consider uh, the, the region's bacteria impairments, um, the 144 assessment units that make up our project area uh, that are impaired uh, or have a concern for bacteria. The implementation plan, as I said, was completed in 2013. Uh, that plan, along with uh, an annual rep report that's produced every year, uh, is tracking things such as uh, wastewater, uh, sanitary sewer overflows, uh, uh, stormwater, and uh, things like that. And so we're trying to address those concerns. Um, as you might imagine, a, a, an implementation plan that contains 11 strategies and 38 activities is fairly large. I think over time we're focusing uh, and have been focusing on aging infrastructure that potentially causes those sanitary sewer overflows, uh, stormwater in our region uh, that brings sediments and bacteria with that into our water body, uh, that certainly has concerns along pet waste and other things, and then failing on-site sewage facilities are, are certainly a key concern for us. We have had some implementation success. Some of the implementation that we've done and carried out uh, has come through our partners. Uh, the city of Houston is focused on sanitary sewer overflows. Harris County has been addressing on-site sewage facilities through Aldine Westfield and airline management district projects. Uh, Harris County has also been incorporating low impact development standards and including those standards in their own capital projects. Uh, Harris County Flood Control District. Uh, we've heard from them uh, yesterday. Uh, there are certainly leaders in our, our region in, in dealing with flooding, but they've also included uh, water quality improvement projects within their uh, detention efforts and other flood management efforts. Uh, targeted monitoring by HJC and by Preservation Association and others is trying to track down those bacteria sources uh, and I've mentioned low impact development green infrastructure practices. There are many outreach and education efforts out there trying to expand those, those uh, practices. Uh, City of Houston has its incentive 
incentives for green development and Texas AgriLife, it's green infrastructure for Texas programs. So there's a lot of, of effort there to try to expand the use of those uh, green infrastructure practices. Uh, HJC has an on-site sewage facility repair and replacement supplemental environmental project. And so uh, trying to get out there uh, with some funding to try to address those failing systems. And finally, uh, the region has certainly a large uh, number of stakeholders that are involved in outreach and education, trying to address fat, soil, and grease and wipes, pet waste, uh, pollution, and reporting. Uh, pollution reporting networks. And so trying to get more uh, folks involved in understanding what they can do to help. So just looking at this uh, graph, um, you can see we've actually seen some improvement in bacteria over time, uh, beginning about 20, 000, 2008. Uh, we've seen a decrease from seven times the standard to a little over four and a half times the standard. Um, just the to get you guys oriented on this uh, graph, because I'll have it, uh, another couple slides as well on this graph too. Um, we have both intercoxy as well as E. coli standards for contact recreation, and they're two different numbers. And so uh, to be able to put uh, those uh, various uh, AUs or assessment units that have uh, either a tidal water body or a freshwater uh, body uh, make those standards allowable in the same graph, we've had to divide those out by the standard itself. And so that's why you see the standard set at one and uh, we're allowed to then uh, compare those. I'll talk a little bit about uh, this larger drop that happened between about 2008 to 2014. Uh, and um, a lot of that happened because of what the city of Houston, Harris County and Harris County Flood Control District have been doing with regards to their stormwater permit, their phase one permit uh, with the state and EPA. Uh, they've, as I mentioned, have been addressing sanitary sewer flows, uh, on-site sewage facilities, as well as including uh, those water quality improvement projects within their flood control district areas. And so a lot of that has probably been uh, the low hanging fruit, things that have happened uh, over time to address uh, bacteria. Uh, one of the big concerns when we first started the implementation plan was the concern about all those wastewater treatment facilities that I mentioned. Uh, again, about 64% of our area is, is covered by centralized wastewater. Uh, those 600 plus uh, uh, wastewater uh, plants, uh, what was going to happen with all that wastewater? And is, is that a concern? Uh, the permit for uh, bacteria, uh, uh, the, the requirements in those permits was just getting started, and so we didn't have any understanding. We have since learned uh, over time, uh, looking at uh, discharge monitoring reports by those wastewater plants, that certainly um, compliance with those permit uh, requirements uh, in terms of uh, fecal bacteria, uh, about 97% compliance. Uh, so certainly there are issues with plants that have some failing uh, from time to time, but by and large, uh, wastewater plants are not uh, the concern. Looking at uh, the on-site sewage facility uh, in, in addressing failing systems, uh, Harris County and East Aldine Management District came together in the late 90s to, to look at the East Aldine Management District area and did a study that uh, determined that some communities within this district had over 30% failure rates with regards to their, their septic systems. And so they look to cobble together $43 million over time through community block grants, Texas Water Development Board's uh, state revolving fund grants, as well as local bonds to essentially connect 811 residential and commercial properties up to centralized wastewater since 2014. That abandoned over uh, 1,400 on-site sewage facilities, those failing systems. A look at and a review of, of data coming down outside of the district on either Greens Bayou or Halls Bayou is determined since 2013, there's been a 20% reduction in bacteria. So certainly things have been happening to uh, improve the water quality in, in our region's bayous and streams. There are challenges, however, and uh, that we're facing in terms of implementing these watershed-based plans, and I'll talk about a few of those. Uh, you've seen this uh, graph before. We're concerned about this uh, stagnation in terms of that decreasing uh, uh, trend line, um, and, and what could, could be the cause of that, and what can we do to get it moving forward. Um, the one thing I need to point out, though, is this is happening at a time when our region's growing still, and so sometimes holding the line uh, can be cons can be seen as a, a, a benefit, uh, something that we're actually successful in maintaining at least that reduction. 
So I mentioned uh, challenges. So we still have over a yearly average of over a thousand sanitary sewer overflows in our region, uh, releasing about 14.6 million gallons uh, yearly uh, into uh, untreated uh, wastewater into our streams and bayous. And so that still is a challenge. Uh, again, I mentioned the city of Houston has been active in trying to address theirs, but there's still some, some challenges with that, that aging infrastructure. Uh, as you move out into the, the uh, areas Outside of the city of Houston, we have a lot more new uh, infrastructure, but we need to be monitoring and maintaining that the, those new uh, inf that new infrastructure to ensure that it's not becoming a problem down the line. There's challenges I mentioned with 150,000 uh, on-site sewage facilities that are either permitted or unpermitted in our region. Uh, they can certainly be a release of of, of, of untreated effluent if uh, they're failing. Uh, some studies say about 12 to 19% to failure rates that can put us up to about 30,000 uh, failing systems out there if we're not managing and taking care of them and treating them like a centralized wastewater just on a personal basis. Development is a certain uh, concern for us. We're losing a lot of that green infrastructure on the outer ba band of, of the city of Houston. How we develop is going to be important over time to make maintaining uh, that, uh, that that ability to function as a kidney for our water quality. And so, uh, looking at ways that we can develop and develop in in a, in a responsible manner are some things that we need to consider as this region continues to develop over time. Uh, I mentioned uh, a lot of the data and some of the things that uh, are of concern. Just looking at implementation in itself, uh, stakeholder involvement for a lot of our plans is a challenge. You know, we have an initial buildup and interest at the very beginning of a plan, uh, but oftentimes that tapers off. You know, these plans are usually in place for 10, 20 or more years, and you might not see that initial uh, drop in, in, in uh, bacteria or whatever the pollutant of concern is at, at, on immediacy. And so you might start seeing stakeholders leave uh, that process. Additionally, we don't always get the representation. We don't have maybe some of the permit holders that we'd like to see at the table helping us make those determinations of what we need to be doing next. And so that's certainly some of the challenges we face uh, going forward. And of course, the, the biggest one is that there's not a long term sustained and dedicated funding source for most of these plans. Uh, and so that presents a challenge in getting folks interested in participating in the process. So I'm going to jump real quick into opportunities, and I want to leave you that, thinking that it's all dark in, in what we need to do going forward, because uh, there's certainly opportunities for us. Um, Talked about those three buckets before the on site sewage facilities, the stormwater, and the sanitary sewer overflow concerns. So, we need to invest in that, uh, invest in it in terms of direct funding, but also in terms of the behavior side of things with regard to our residents, understanding how their role in maintaining and improving in, uh, water quality is part of their, their effort, too. And so, we need to target that as an investment for us, uh, changing that term wastewater to something more beneficial. Um, there are permits to address stormwater. Uh, those permits require addressing impaired waters. And so we as, as residents can walk into our city government and ask them, how are you doing and what are you doing to improve uh, waters that are impaired? And so recognizing and understanding that there are impairments there, again, 42% of the bacteria implementation groups project area is under a phase two permit. Uh, and, and to address stormwater. And so uh, that, that's an opportunity for us to go forward. Additionally, uh, there's been a, a tremendous investment in modeling best practices to address water quality. Um, so we maintain a database of those 70 plus uh, model projects out there and more are being implemented as we speak. And so there's an opportunity to, to look at what your neighbor's doing and bring that into your own, uh, own municipality and community. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, briefly on implementation that there's a variety of outreach and education efforts that are ongoing. Uh, there's structural best practices such as pet waste stations being implemented. And so there's really a, a synergy of opportunity to continue moving forward. Uh, so I just want to leave you again with opportunities on a more personal scale. So I, I mentioned there's waste, uh, there's uh, implementation plans and water protection plans in your neighborhood. And so there's an opportunity to get in, involved uh, with those plan developments, as well as get involved with the continuing success of those plans going forward in implementation. Uh, 
If you know of a success and, and, and you have a success that you'd like to report, please do so to those local plans. Uh, report to me if you have something that you'd like us to try to shout out and, and, and get the word out about. Um, Short-term funding, again, just because there's a, a plan in place and HJC may have sponsored it or one of our other partners has sponsored the plan development, doesn't mean you can't use that plan uh, to help get local funding, foundation funding, uh, even state funding uh, to begin work in your own watershed. Uh, that's the po point of getting those plans in place is to do that. Uh, change the message, uh, make sure that there's a vision uh, to go forward with. Um, Mont Bellevue is a city that's taken on green infrastructure and I, I usually sh uh, shout out about their, their ability. They've changed their, their ordinances and looked at being forward thinking. It, again, change our own message and, and try to expand what we can do. Uh, look at things like quality of life, economics. We've talked at the symposium about making uh, detention basins and other features, parks and what have you into a variety of multi multi-use uh, opportunity, include white water quality uh, project within those uh, uh, green infra infrastructure, uh, 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 green, green spaces and what have you. Um, so there's an economic opportunity there as well. Uh, again, and empower uh, your citizen volunteers, uh, ears and eyes on the ground uh, can document and report water quality concerns, uh, have that civic voice walk into your municipality and, and ask those, those important questions about impairments and how you can get involved. Uh, so I'll leave you with that. Just want to acknowledge that uh, the Texas Commission on Water Quality supports the efforts of the Bacteria Implementation Group, as well as our region in terms of improving water quality. I uh, just want to give them that note. And uh, with that, if we have a little bit of time, I know we're at our bio break, and I tried to speed things up a little bit just to help that, help that along. Hopefully, I wasn't too fast. No, Stephen, that was great. Thank you so much for those updates on the big and uh, explaining TMDLs. Um, I'm curious on those TMDLs, pollutant levels, as as if we look at it how the structure of the biosystems leading into the into the Gulf work, do we see an increase in TMDLs as you get further downstream closer to the Gulf? Or is the structure of these systems with the, the plants that are removing and, and collecting or, or, you know, in other words, is it, it are the TMDLs higher, you know, uh, upstream or are they higher downstream or, or, you know, does that depend on the bayou? You know, is it, it concrete or is it natural? I think it mostly depends on the sources and how where those sources are located. Um, so we find, for instance, down in Mustang Bayou, um, you, know, you have some cities that are closer to the coastal part of, of the, the watershed. Uh, you're going to see some inputs there. Uh, so it really depends on um, where those sources are in relation to the water body. Uh, certainly, if you're closer to the water body, if you have an on-site sewage facility that's failing, you're going to have a larger impact to those monitoring stations that gather the data. Uh, so it, it really is a, a, not, not, a, not a simple answer, certainly. No, uh, clearly it's not. Uh, so it'll be interesting uh, later in our presentation this afternoon, we'll be talking about OSSF so a little bit more and, and uh, you know, what the benefits are between uh, treating wastewater in mass the way we do for cities and mud districts versus doing OSSFs uh, on-site sewage. Uh, so that'll be very interesting. But uh your work at HJC and, and those, uh, you, I know you have a huge crew there that is working on these programs and we thank you for tracking all of this and letting us know how we're doing and what else we need to do in the future. Certainly happy to do it. Great to have you. And now we will take a short break, uh, get that cup of coffee refilled and uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes after these uh, commercial messages, uh, videos from uh, two of our sponsors, uh, EHRA and Hawes Hill. We'll be back in just a few minutes.
What does PCS do? The activities of the Pollution Control Services Department, PCS, are directed toward ensuring clean air and water for the citizens of Harris County consistent with the protection of public health, enjoyment of property and the protection of plant, animal, and marine life. As we look toward the future, our commitment to excellence continues to propel us to build solid, ground-down foundations today that will meet the evolving demands of tomorrow. As our population grows and land use needs change, we will continue to bring the most advanced, creative, and impactful visions to the communities we serve. As we continue our mission of engineering the future. Hawes Hill & Associates, working with our local government clients for economic development, public safety, and so much more. Right, when we get going again this morning, continue with our presentations. Our next presenter is Homegrown. We'd like to introduce one of our staff members of the Biopreservation Association, Grant Moss, who is our Restoration and Science Program Manager. Uh, his uh, presentation is going to be on nature-based solutions to challenges in high growth areas like ours. Uh, including trends associated with the viability of birds, aquatic, and land creatures. Um, let's see, Terry Hershey always called them critters. That's what I remember. Um, she loved uh, the land creatures as, as Grant is describing them, but um, the critters that uh, inhabit our, uh, our estuaries, our watersheds, our bayous are critical to, uh, to, that, to that health. And so I think tracking you know how that viability is is incredibly important and grant is going to share with us uh, what he does for biopreservation association and tell us a little bit more about um, the the health of our bodies from our aquatic standpoint grant welcome this morning i see you you've got your video going yes um welcome thank you for having the symposium me. for the first time <laughs> Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Grant Moss. I'm uh, the Conservation Program Manager for the Bayou Preservation Association. So I manage 
our stream corridor restoration and our water quality projects. Um, and I'm here to talk about um, of the projects that are um, that involves stream corridor restoration. So, okay. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, one of the initiatives that one of our committees was engaged with. Um, and to talk about Bayou Preservation's guiding principles for stream corridor restoration. Okay. Um, so stream corridors are essential regional resources and provide numerous benefits to our region from recreational opportunities to mitigating flood risk, um, to protecting water quality, uh, but human activities have significantly altered these natural areas and have affected both the stability and functionality of these systems. And so Bayou Preservation Association advocates for and employs nature-based solutions uh, in our work to improve um, these stream corridor systems and regional resiliency. Um, so to guide this work, the Bayou Preservation Association Board created these guiding principles for stream corridor restoration. Um, and the four principles are incorporating outreach for successful stream corridor restoration, applying a comprehensive approach to preserve, improve, and restore stream corridors, and using best practices to support stream form functions and values, and planning for sustainability and resilience in future benefits, impacts, and needs. And following these four principles for um, stream corridor projects and enhancement will create resilient, sustainable, and enjoyable places for communities and foster uh, that harmonious coexistence with these natural assets. So to aid in the adoption and execution of these principles, the Bayou Preservation Association, with uh, an incredible amount of effort from our Stream Corridor Restoration Committee, um, so any individuals in that committee that had a hand in this that are on the call today, thank you very, very much. Um, we created um, the Stream Corridor Restoration uh, Checklist. Um, to help implement these principles in our projects. And we created this um, checklist to, and designed it to be used as a dynamic set of guidelines um, that is revisited and integrated into each stage of the project process um, and to serve as a continuous reference. So it has a lot of questions to ask yourself at each project phase pertaining to these principles. It provides a lot of references and resources to help you um, decide how to move forward within these uh, in implementing these principles. And we made this checklist readily available um, on our website um, for you to download and to reference and to use in your projects. Um, so regarding the first principle of incorporating outreach, it is vital that communities understand, care about, and actively protect their local streams. Uh, we believe that is foundational for successful stream corridor restoration projects. Um, and we need to make sure that our projects are continuously engaging the community. Uh, we need to have ongoing engagement from project inception and throughout uh, to completion. Um, and we believe that successful engagement involves a variety of methods, like engagement in the communities themselves, early notification of project activities, um, soliciting meaningful community input um, during the project planning and during the implementation phases. And the goal of this all should be to cultivate ownership and appreciation um, by these local communities. We need to be using common language that, every, that those communities can understand why we are doing this project and its purpose and benefits, um, both to the environment and to the community and to our region. Um, and we need to be asking ourselves questions such as, are we involving communications expertise in our project? Uh, maybe we have communication staff or we have um, volunteers who have expertise in this, in this area, or are we using uh, paid consult consultants for this work? Um, and are we evaluating the multiple outreach and engagement methods that are available to us um, and really trying to define which ones would work best for the communities we're trying to engage? Our projects need to take a comprehensive approach. Um, so stream corridors should be managed by a uh, watershed and floodplain, not just by political or agency boundaries. Um, because what happens in, in the city 
or the county or the precinct next door um, or upstream has impacts on me um, living further down in the watershed. And we also need to be considering the entire stream, not just you know, the channel that we're seeing, but also the riparian areas, the aquatic life, um, and the floodplain relationships. We need to be optimizing natural functions, preserving what is already beneficial to these stream networks, um, and also aiming to restore, enhance, and improve streams to optimize their natural functions and values so that they can provide a lot of those ecosystem services to us and to the uh, region as a whole. We need to prevent negative outcomes, avoiding or reducing those impacts that our projects might have on the stream network um, and ensuring that our future activities do not harm the, our waterways. Um, and throughout all of our project processes, we need to demand a no net loss of riparian function. Unfortunately, in such heavily urbanized watersheds like we have in Houston, we have lost a lot of that riparian function. So we need to work um, diligently to protect what's uh, still here um, and to, at the bare minimum, make sure we're not uh, losing any of that function and to every effort possible that we are improving the function of our riparian areas. We need to be taking a multidisciplinary approach um, does, uh, and design our projects by engaging a wide variety of stakeholders with a range of expertise uh, to make sure that our projects are being considered um, from many different professional lenses to make sure we aren't missing any of those key factors that might hinder project success. And we need to be asking ourselves questions such as which disciplines are covered in the approach when we're planning our project? Uh, why are we engaging these? And why might we not be engaging others? And possibly should we, or can we? Um, and does our project support healthy riparian, aquatic, and benthic resources? Um, and have we balanced these considerations with other uses like public access and use? Um, because a lot of our projects do happen in public parks um, and that is uh, a major asset to our natural areas is recreation. Our third principle is to use best practices and it's uh, important that we're using these kind of uh, up-to-date and proven methodologies to ensure that we, our projects have the best chance of success. Um, we want to have, make sure that our projects have clear restoration goals that should be measure that should have measurable outcomes. Uh, so we have um, a way to test whether we are actually um, able to accomplish uh, the goals that we set out to accomplish, and we can help keep ourselves accountable um, by measuring our success. Uh, we also need to be have a comprehensive design. Um, looking at stream channel form considerations, such as the cross sections of the channel, what the channel looks like banked from bank to bank. What is the meander pattern of our channel? Um, what is the upstream to downstream elevation change of our channel? Uh, all of these factors um, that the natural stream would be um, engaged in uh, affect how it behaves. Um, and so when we are striving to implement these natural stable design uh, channel designs, uh, we need to keep all of that in mind. Um, we need to evaluate the stream in the landscape context. We can't just look at the stream itself um, as an isolated thing, but we have to look at the entire watershed and the effects and pressures it has on the stream and on our project sites. And we need to identify suitable stream segments when we're engaging in these restoration uh, efforts uh, so that we have points of comparison to evaluate project success. Are we able to hit the mark that we are shooting at? And we need to be asking questions such as, are we defining those appropriate measures for success? Um, and how are we defining them? And are we developing a baseline assessment before we start the project so that we know where the project started and how what effects our project might have had on various um, uh, processes. We also need to be planning for sustainability. Um, so we need to, as I mentioned before, we need to integrate those best design practices so that we can make sure that these, these tested methods um, are being implemented so that our projects have um, the best chances at a viable lifespan. Um, and we need to align uh, our projects with the three components of sustainable development, which is often called the triple bottom line, those ecological, economic, and social considerations that are always at play 
that determine which projects get funded, uh, where these projects are, are able to take place, um, and when, and how much funding these projects get. Um, so balancing those three is always uh, tricky. We also need to balance short and long-term goals. Um, what short-term goals kind of uh, prompted us to implement this project? Um, but also looking at the long-term goal, both of this specific project, how will it fare into the future um, and considering those maintenance needs, but also what is the goals um, for stream corridor restoration and management for the region at large and how does my project or how can my project play into those goals? We need to be adopting um, adaptive management measures um, and being able to adjust to changing circumstances um, the map that I have up here shows, you know, the projected growth of the Houston area. Um, so when we're talking about climate change or we're talking about different, uh, you know, development pressures or other uh, environmental factors or even sociopolitical factors that might impact the future um, needs of our project, we need to be able to adapt um, and address those as they appear. And we need to ask ourselves questions such as, are we identifying a plan for sustainable and future maintenance of the project? Um, and how will it be maintained over its lifetime after that initial funding has been spent? Uh, do we have a plan for that? Um, and are we taking into account changes in rainfall and climate um, or development pressures? But in this, as in all things, there are challenges to implementing these uh, principles. Uh, when it comes to community engagement, diverse communities are indeed an asset, and Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the, in the country. Um, but these communities all look different. They all um, have different um, needs, and they all have different communication styles. Um, so we need to tailor our community, our engagement efforts to these, to these specific communities that we're trying to engage. We can't use a one-size-fits-all approach. And we need to have that sustained engagement, um, which can be difficult and costly, uh, depending on how much uh, resources our organizations have to engage in this work. But we believe it is key to help, again, foster that ownership of these communities for our natural areas. Um, when it comes to comprehensive management, implementing uh, this, the multidisciplinary approach um, and, and engaging all of those disciplines adds complexity to project coordination um, and likely can incorporate added costs. Um, but we need to make sure that we are looking at all of the variables that we can to ensure that we are uh, doing a project that will stand the test of time and that will do what we hope it will do in improving uh, those natural functions. And again, balancing the natural functions as well as the social needs or political pressures while also preserving floodplains and avoiding negative outcomes requires careful planning um, and will often uh, require trade-offs. And we need to be adhering to those best practices. Um, so when it comes to data, ensuring that we're using the most recent and accurate data um, and also uh, frequently revisiting and adjusting methodologies as new proven uh, methodologies um, come out uh, can be resource intensive. Uh, but again, if we're using the most um, state-of-the-art science, uh, we are uh, ideally giving our projects the best chance at success. And incorporating natural stable channel design principles may require a deeper understanding of ecosystem dynamics um, and require additional design efforts than we were originally planning. Um, or that you know, perhaps our, our original project budgets allowed for. Um, when it comes to sustainability, that long-term planning is also key. Um, adapting to those changing conditions um, and considering the future and regional needs um, for how this project can fit into those. And embracing that flexible adaptive management model. Um, again, that flexibility can be tricky um, and will require ongoing monitoring of our project to um, address these changing needs. So I will leave you with this call to action, um, which are to celebrate the benefits of our stream that our streams provide to our local communities, protect the rich natural history and ecological diversity of our stream corridors, 
restore the physical, chemical, and biological processes of these vital ecosystems. Um, and I'll also add to uh, download our, our checklist. Our um, committee put a lot of work into it, and there are a lot of great resources and references in there. Uh, and we uh, want you, we made it to be used. Um, so we want people to, to look through it, to use it, to use the, the suggested questions and, and use the resources to help guide and, and maybe hone their project planning and implementation process. And again, thank you to, uh, to the, our partners. Um, a huge thank you to the String Quarter Restoration Committee who uh, really did all of the, the uh, nuts and bolts of this checklist. Um, I mostly just compiled all of their hard work um, there at the end, uh, but the committee members um, have been a uh, huge help in implementing this project. Um, that's all I have. Grant, thank you very much. Um, the the committee that you're mentioning, the, the Restoration Committee, uh, has been mm -hmm. operating for uh, a number of years in various uh, capacities. Um, but what would you say is their greatest uh, achievement thus far? Um, well, this, uh, at least during my time here, this um, this checklist is, I, I believe, a crowning achievement for the committee because it is a document that does exist. It is usable and it is widely, uh, easily available to practitioners, uh, to the committee members themselves. Um, they put a lot of effort into it. They got to put what their um, expertise and their um, share what they believe is important to stream quarter work uh, into this checklist. Um, and so we hope that um, their efforts will, will be put to use. Um, we also uh, have been able to do a lot of uh, educational activities by doing um, site visits to other restoration projects. So we've been able to uh, convene, so to speak, uh, these stream quarter restoration practitioners to, to view each other's projects and to brainstorm um, and see what kind of methods are being used in different parts of the, of the region, um, kind of talk about which methodologies have worked, which ones didn't. Um, I know Kelly Andrasik um, from Houston Parks and Recreation was telling us about one of their restoration projects on Tuesday. Um, and their uh, plantings, and they kind of did some uh, trial and error on what, what worked with their tree plantings and what methodologies definitely didn't, um, which is beneficial to the members that are engaging in this work. So learning from others. Yes. Yeah. When you go out onto a site, what's the thing that kind of energizes you the most, what lights you up the most when you see a, a project from, you know, uh, uh, its commencement and the conditions at that time versus what happens closer to the end or even in the middle when you see, start to see the transformations? Yeah, I I think it's always kind of that that progression. Um, so it's it, depending on the type of project, it can be hard to see. Um, but in our, one of the projects we're doing down in Challenger 7, we're doing a lot of invasive removal. Um, so that an initial... Um, removal can be kind of drastic depending on how thick those invasives are. So it, it is cool to see that drastic reduction in that invasive canopy. Um, but I get really energized when I come several months later and I see those native plants that have kind of just been uh, dormant in the sea bank waiting to kind of reemerge now that that uh, competition has been removed and seeing kind of that restoration to those more native uh, ecosystems. I also like seeing um, when we, uh, the results of these planting efforts. You know, I've, I've seen quite a bit of, of plantings when, you know, when the trees are only two feet tall um, and the plants are really small, but it is, it, it's incredibly exciting to come back, you know, two years later and see that all those plants have filled in, that those um, channels that look kind of scary when all the construction was happening and it's a bunch of bare dirt with these small plants, uh, but actually seeing that, uh, that, this, that this work, that it does work um, and that these, um, systems can be restored. Absolutely. And since we have the spotlight for just one more minute, um, talk real quick about what biopreservation has been doing down at Challenger 7. That's been a long project. We've been working on that for, mm -hmm. for quite a while, and the results are so impressive, so amazing to see down there. Talk a little bit, uh, just briefly, to educate everyone on, on uh, the scope of what we've been doing down there. Yeah, so we've been working with um, Harris County, um, 
down at Challenger 7 Memorial Park in the Webster Clear Lake area. It is right on the shores of Clear Creek. Um, so it is a riparian park. Uh, it was originally in precinct one and then halfway through our project, it did switch over to precinct two. So we worked with both precincts on this project. Um, and thank you uh, to both um, for being such great project partners, but it's uh, primarily uh, involving habitat restoration in that riparian zone. So we've been doing, hitting it really hard with invasive removal, removing a lot of those tallow and legustrum trees um, that are invasive and they grow really quickly um, and, and robustly, and they kind of shade out a lot of the native plants. Um, so we've been working with our contractor, uh, Eric of EBR Enterprises, did a lot of work for us down there, uh, removing all those trees. Um, and we've seen a lot of natural recruitment of those native grasses and forbs come back. Uh, we were also able to install some interpretive signage. Uh, we worked with a local artist um, to, to educate people, you know, why riparian areas are important. Uh, what riparian areas even are, because I, I know I forget that that's not a common word that a lot of people use. Um, so I say it all the time, I hear it all the time in this work, but you know, when I'm telling my friends and family, they're like, what does that even mean? Uh, so we felt that it was really important to explain, you know, what is a riparian area? Why, do, why should you care? Um, what are invasive species and why are they a problem? And, and why should we really focus on native species uh, management and improvement? Um, and so we, we to date, uh, I believe it's been a little over 50 acres that we've been able to restore. And we did receive funding uh, for another round of work down there. Uh, so we're going to target an additional 15 acres um, and work to install um, an audio tour uh, that people can go and, and listen to uh, audio interpretive uh, information, as well as the signs that we've already installed. So. Wonderful, yeah, and I encourage everybody to go check out uh, that park and, and uh, see all that all that work. And it it does uh, it's another one of those examples of of such a different environment than our our, mm -hmm. our urban environment, and mm -hmm. why Houston is and the Houston region is such a unique place uh, because we have so many ecologies ecosystems that we can uh, visit in such a short distance, and then you've got mm -hmm. this fabric running through the whole thing. Uh, yes, yeah. So. Well, Grant, thank you very much for today's presentation. Thank you for joining us. And uh, uh, thank you. We, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in future symposiums. Thank you so much. Next, let's move on to Ashley Gruder. Uh, uh, she is the Director of Research and Water Conservation uh, for the uh, Harris Galveston Subsidence District. Um, and she's going to be presenting a regulatory approach for water planning that evaluates land surface impacts. Uh, so a little bit of background on this, the, the Harrison Galvin Subsidence District and the uh, Fort Bend Subsidence District uh, had a review of their regulatory plans back in 2020 uh, to better understand the impact of uh, future population growth uh, and what that water demand would be on the land surface uh, in uh, here in the Texas Gulf Coast. So uh, this review uh, culminated in a, it, it was a culmination of a three-year study uh, to see how can we continue to grow while protecting our land from future subsidence, uh, which obviously is uh, when our land is no longer at the same elevation that we started with, um, not a good thing. So recharge obviously is one of those things, planning uh, for development and, and growth is, is another, and um, Ashley is here to talk more about that. Welcome, ma'am. Great, thank you. Um, can you all hear me and see the screen okay? I guess. Absolutely, you are ready okay. to go. Perfect. Great. I can just advance my slide. There we go. So today I will focus on subsidence, the Harris Galveston Subsidence District's regulatory process, as well as ongoing and exciting research projects that we have. And I'll note that throughout the presentation, you will see QR codes that are shown on the slide. If any of these topics or all of these topics interest you, please be sure to scan those codes and enjoy reading those reports. So let's start with subsidence. So firstly, what is it? You know, I know um, Spran already mentioned that it's when the land sinks, um, but it's defined as the lowering of the land surface over time due to changes in the subsurface. So particularly for our region, Houston-Galveston coastal region, subsidence is caused from the compaction of the clay and the silt lenses within the aquifer due to excessive groundwater withdrawal. 
And as illustrated in the diagram on the right, prior to groundwater extraction, those elongated brown circles represent those clays and those silts are very loosely packed and oriented in many different directions. But over time, as groundwater is pumped out of the aquifer and the clay minerals will rearrange and they'll rearrange in such a way that they'll stack on top of each other and they'll shrink. And this is the compaction in the aquifer that is realized all the way at the surface as subsidence and can come with some serious consequences. So for example, some impacts of subsidence that we have seen throughout our region include infrastructure damage, flooding, surficial fissures or cracks. Um, and the pictures shown here include damage from utilities as shown in the picture of that first protruding well. So you can see under that concrete slab, you actually see exposed well casing. That is not ideal. That is not how these wells are designed. Um, and that is actually subsidence of the land surface. We also see a construction of a new bit bridge in the background to allow for more freeboard since that prior bridge, the one in the forefront is now too low. Um, we also have permanent flooding of coastal homes as seen on the home foundation remnants that were completely inundated and now part of the bay at the Brownwood subdivision, which is now Baytown's nature center. And then also, as many familiar in this region, flooding, like the devastating flood from Hurricane Harvey back in 2017. <clears throat> so now I'm going to highlight the Brownwood subdivision in greater detail. So we'll start off easy with the picture on the right that shows John Ellis holding a survey rod on a monument, which is actually a benchmark, a little disc right on that concrete post. And you'll notice that the rod has the years 1915 to 2021. And those years represent dates that that specific benchmark was occupied and basically collected elevation data and helped instruct the graph that we see on the left-hand side. So those years on the post are represented as those red dots on the graph with the red dashed line and show the change in the surface over time. So we can see from 1915 through around 1973, this location actually sunk by over nine feet. And then that decreasing trend of that red dash line is very similar to the trend of that tan line just beneath it that represents the groundwater level from a nearby monitoring well. So over 200 feet of aquifer level decline resulted in around nine feet of subsidence. And this really demonstrates the correlation between declining water levels, associated aquifer compaction and subsidence at the surface. But then you'll notice something happened. We see from the rod in that picture that the 1976 and 2021 years are almost right on top of each other and no subsidence occurred, and aquifer water levels, as shown in that tan line, actually started to rise. So some of you might be wondering, well, what happened to produce this change? And some of you already know that the answer is the creation of the Harris-Galveston Subsidence District. So we were established in 1975 to prevent land subsidence through the regulation of groundwater withdrawal. And we at the district achieve our mission by collaboration and reasonable regulation, investigating the best available research, monitoring the land surface and water use and supply, and promoting water conservation through education resources and tools for everyone in our region to use. So now I'm gonna dive into some details of our regulatory framework. It all begins with research and data collection, as data is the forefront of our policies as we identify where subsidence is occurring and understand water availability. Then we communicate our results to stakeholders and establish our regulations using those data sets like population growth and water demand, land use changes, and changes in the land surface, alternative water supply infrastructure, and implementation timelines, 
and offer options to enable adaptive management strategies. Next, we'll monitor that water use, both groundwater and alternative supply. We'll also monitor groundwater levels and the land surface to ensure that our regulations are effectively upholding our mission. And then we publish our monitoring results every year in our annual groundwater report. So now let's focus on that large arrow that points from the monitoring all the way back to research. This loop is essential as the population grows and the water demand increases. This circular process allows the district to adapt and to change our regulations when necessary. So in the early years, following the formation of the district, regulation was enacted specifically to those coastal areas as they had subsided the most with as much as 10 feet in the Houston Ship Channel. This area was called the area of concentrated emphasis. And then the population growth was spreading north and westward, so more research needed to be done. This later produced eight regulatory areas in 1985, as shown in the middle map on the left. And then let's fast forward another decade with more growth and accompanied water use, and of course, more research. The 1999 regulatory plan modified the regulatory areas into the three that we still use today. Then by the early 2000s, regulatory areas one and two were fully converted to alternative source waters. And that means that area one permittees who are in that geographic location, which is the majority of Galveston County and some Southern parts of Southeastern Harris County can use no more than 10% of groundwater from their total water demand. And then area two, which represents that upper sliver of Galveston County and then Central and Eastern Harris County has no more than 20% groundwater available to them with their total water demand. Now, area three, which is the northern and western portions of Harris County, is still converting to alternative source waters. And we do have future milestones occurring in 2025 that will shift to only 40% groundwater use, and then another in 2035 to 20% groundwater use, as we see in area two. So you've seen with these different maps, the district has changed our regulation based on the best available research and monitoring that we have. And now I bet you're wondering, how exactly do we accomplish this? Well, as Ms. Brown mentioned earlier, you're in luck because we are undergoing this exact process today. So the 2023 Joint Regulatory Plan Review initiated in January of 2020 with the Harris-Galveston Subsidence District and the Fort Bend Subsidence District. And this project has four main tasks. The first task was performed by Fries and Nichols is to develop our population projections using updated 2020 census data and forecasting future population projections and water demand through the year 2100. Task two is to conduct an alternative water supply assessment done by Civitas Engineering, which was formerly KIT professionals, and task three involves the development of a groundwater flow and subsidence model, which was performed by the US Geological Survey. And then finally, we put those pieces, that one, two, and three together to model various scenarios to help us evaluate the performance of our regulatory plan in upholding the district's mission. So I'll go into each of these tasks in a little greater detail. So what we see here is a snapshot of population projected to grow at 2050, represented as the percent change when compared to the 2020 census data that we have. And that map in that table showed the 10 counties that were analyzed in this task. The map shows the percent change based on the census tract, where the darker green colors indicate a higher positive percent change, which is showing growth. And the, the pink colors that we see are a decrease in the percent change. But predominantly what we see is growth. The results demonstrate that tracks in Western Fort Bend County, Eastern Harris County and Northern Montgomery County are forecasted to grow by over 200% by 2050 when compared to the 2020 values. And some counties like Chambers 
are projected to double. These projections were also provided to regional planning groups like Region H that Jason highlighted yesterday morning, and as well as the Texas Water Development Board and the Texas Demographic Center. And these data sets were also utilized in the development of the water demand, which is used as the input parameter in our groundwater model that we have in task three. It's also important to understand the availability of alternative source waters, as well as their spatial variability to adequately address the water supply and areas that are projected to grow. So this covers our second task, which is the alternative water supply assessment. And it involved researching options, focusing on the ones that were most likely to be developed and evaluating those supplies with key goals in mind. Some of those goals are shown here and include estimating the supply amounts, those magnitudes, preparing some cost estimates from implementation to production, considering impacts on water quality, as well as permitting procedures, identifying timelines and assessing vulnerabilities like climate and subsidence impacts. Over 20 alternative supplies were reviewed and seven were shortlisted as the most viable options, and those are seen on the map on the right. So the approximate magnitudes and those location-specific options are provided in this map, and what we see is surface water supply is still the dominating alternate water supply with increased potential for reclaimed water on both the non-potable and potable side, as well as projected water conservation through demand management. And I will also note some key takeaways from this assessment was that the total alternate water supplies actually exceed the projected future demands. And as you can see from the map, the availability is not exactly spatially uniform. And some of these options that are highlighted and, and sound viable may actually require significant regional coordination from local all the way to state agencies, such as we see the option on the coast as seawater desalination. So now we've assessed the water supply and the future water demand. We're going to now explore how we use those data sets to determine the impacts on the aquifer as well as subsidence. So the Gulf Coast Land Subsidence and Groundwater Flow Model, named Gulf for short, was the third task in this joint regulatory plan review and involved a series of updates to the previous groundwater flow model, which was referred to as the Houston Area Groundwater Model or HAGM, developed in 2012 for our regional aquifer of the Gulf Coast. Such modifications include the addition of historical groundwater pumping through, through 2018 and calibrations and updates to model packages and parameters, which I'm not going to get into specifics, but if you're interested, you can click on the full report. It is very detailed and has a lot of good information. So we use this image on the right is showing the model configuration of the different layers that are within that model from the Chico and Evangeline and the Jasper aquifers, which are the main units that are used for groundwater pumping in our region, with Chico being used closest to the coast in areas like Galveston and Brazoria counties, and then Jasper is utilized further inland and north in areas like Montgomery County. This model was also presented to our region's groundwater management area, group GMA 14, as well as the Texas Water Development Board for consideration as the model for our region's groundwater availability model. So as this work is still ongoing, we are currently developing and evaluating our scenarios, which you will recall is step four in our JRPR tasks. We use the demand as our input and take it to understand what impact that future projected pumping will have on the aquifer. We look at the water levels, we look at compaction and the subsidence, all thanks to the updates in this groundwater flow model. And we anticipate this work to conclude and have final reports available to the public and stakeholders in early of 2024. And as I mentioned earlier, the district uses the research to develop reasonable regulations and monitors ongoing to ensure our goals are being achieved. So now let's review how we monitor. We collaborate with numerous local to federal agencies, as well as university as the ones listed here, to create and uphold a holistic data set 
to guide our regulatory framework and assist with water management strategies. Our data sets include aquifer research from measuring water levels and compaction to enhancing those subsurface models through refinements and lithology and other hydrologic parameters. We use water use data from both groundwater and alternative water supply that we require from our permittees on an annual basis, as well as land surface data from our GPS station with our subsidence monitoring network to INSAR and the periodic survey campaigns that we have done since the beginning. So all of these data set categories, as well as looking at climate and those impacts are published every year in the district's annual groundwater report. So now let's focus a little bit more on the subsidence data. So the district, as I mentioned, collects GPS station data from our stations that are scattered over 10 counties in Southeast Texas. Those are represented as those dots on the map on the right. These data are processed by Dr. Wong at the University of Houston to obtain the ellipsoidal height, which is basically the vertical direction of that point on the Earth's surface to estimate rates of change. And this map shows the annual subsidence rate averaged over five years from 2018 to 2022. And we see those larger, warmer colors represent stations that are experiencing higher subsidence rates at over two centimeters a year. And those small green circles are stations that measured less than half a centimeter per year. And we see in the fully converted areas, again, those areas one and two, all those dots along those areas are green, which tells us there's no ongoing subsidence occurring. And this really highlights the impact of the significant collaboration and invested infrastructure from the city of Houston and regional water authorities to provide that alternative water. So we're not using as much groundwater and we're not impacting the surface and as well as our other permittees that limit the groundwater use to prevent this future subsidence. And we also see in Western and Northern portions of Harris County that comprises regulatory area three, those future conversion milestones will help to minimize future subsidence experienced here, especially as we see those largest red dots in the Katy area. So now you might be wondering, it's great to have this network coverage with these dots, but what's going on in between those dots and how do we measure that? So now let's connect those dots together. So we use Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar, or INSAR for short, to see the changes in the land surface in between those GPS stations that you saw on that map. This allows for a broader regional coverage that can be further calibrated and verified by our GPS stations. The INSAR is a remote sensing technology, for those of you who are not familiar with it, that uses a sensor or a satellite to basically take a picture of the Earth's surface, and then it will continue its orbit around our Earth and take another picture of the relatively same location about two weeks later. Then those two pictures are processed and compared to see if the land is rising or if it's sinking. And these maps show the evolution of the land surface deformation in the greater Houston Galveston region from the early 1990s to 2020. And again, the warmer colors indicate subsidence and the cooler colors represent no change and even in some areas, some minor uplift. As we can see, we observe some of those higher rates as much as five centimeters per year in the Jersey Village area in the mid 1990s as the population was growing outwards. And now we see as we've evolved through time that that has now spread and moved to Western Harris County with the Katy area seen as much as two centimeters per year. And for those of you who aren't in the metric system, as I know we in America are usually aren't, um, that's about three quarters of an inch per year. So now I'm gonna switch gears to showcase some additional research projects that the district conducts, conducts to better understand subsidence impacts in our region. So this is a recent project on the Spring Creek watershed that evaluated inland flooding from projected subsidence through 2070. This work was done by Michael Baker International and included the use of flood risk or H&H models 
in coordination with the Harris County Flood Control District as we used their Map Next model, as well as groundwater use scenarios to create subsidence grids that were then used in Map Next. So in addition to the hydrologic and hydraulic modeling results, this project analyzed the economic impacts due to fluvial flooding by investigating damages and cost estimates for buildings and their contents, like cars and a garage, furniture and other contents in homes, to infrastructure like bridges and pipelines, even roadways that would be untravelable, untravelable, as we see from the map that that includes I-45 along the eastern portion of Spring Creek and serves as a major evacuation route for our region. This project and the accompanied results will become available upon the release of Map Next from the Harris County Flood Control District. And lastly, but certainly not least, I'd like to discuss and, and present the programs and resources that the district uses for water conservation. Some of you may be familiar with our school program since it's been available since 1994 and provides water resource and subsidence educations completely free to third through sixth grade students and teachers in Harris and Galveston counties, thanks to the generous support of sponsors like our permittees, MUD, cities, and water authorities. And I'm excited to share that we have now started offering again in-class presentations this school year with a new edition of a subsidence demo that was actually done two days ago with our Denise Mall, our water conservation coordinator. And it was a real hit for the students. They loved seeing the impacts of when we take water out of the aquifer, how the land sinks on top. And it was really great to see them getting involved and wanting to make a difference for our region. I'll also note that we are a sponsor of Water My Yard and maintain evapotranspiration weather stations that are used in those weekly watering recommendations offered in this app. And I strongly encourage everyone to download the free app or subscribe using that website link to receive lawn water recommendations that are tailored specifically to the user-defined irrigation systems to help save our precious resource and be responsible irrigators. We also offer a grant program since 2020 that provides funding for projects that will reduce water use and enhance water conservation through water loss control measures, water efficiencies, and research. These grants are available now and have an open enrollment process. So if you have a project that you've been wanting to execute but don't really have the financial backing to do it, please scan that QR code, visit our website, select the category that's applicable to your project and submit your application today. So I thank you for the opportunity to showcase the Harris Galveston Subsidence District Commission, some of our research, research and our regulatory framework and I provided my contact info and the district's contact info if you have any um, questions for us. And I'd be happy to take questions now if there are any. Yes, Ashley, thank you so much. Um, sure. I can't get that image of the Brownwood uh, subdivision out of my head. I, I, I remember when all that was occurring back in the 70s when I was much younger. Um, and it, it is, it's the cautionary tale of the whole area, right? Yes. But, is it true that so your graph indicated that although there was a rise in the monitoring of the of the water uh, underground, the the land has not uh, gone back up. Is that the compaction that occurred, and so those soils cannot recover in that way and and push the land back up nine feet? No, that's a very great point. So a lot of when we hit aquifer compaction that comes all the way to the surface as subsidence. Usually that's what we refer to as inelastic deformation, which means once it's gone, it can't come back up. Um, and that's exactly what we have at the Brownwood subdivision. Now, you may have noticed, especially in this drought that we've had this past summer, that you may see some surficial cracks of that Beaumont clay. Now, there is at the surface some shrink swell that can be recoverable, but not when you're talking about these, uh, what we're doing to our aquifers and that compaction there is not recoverable. Right. Okay. Understood. Um, talk a little bit about how uh, mud wells. So we have mud districts all in unincorporated uh, areas of our counties that are supplying services to residents. They're drilling their own wells. Um, 
do you share data with those or do they share with you or how, how uh, is there any coordination between that in, in these unincorporated areas? Yes. So if you are unincorporated or not, if you have a groundwater well in Harris or Galveston County you, and it's not for a single family residential, which you'd be exempt, um, you would have to have a permit through us. And as I mentioned, we have a process where we will actually have an annual report that we send every year to all of our permittees asking for their water use data, both groundwater, what they pump from that well, and if they have alternative water that they use and how much alternative water they used. So we okay. do collect that data and Got present it. it in our annual report. Excellent. Okay. And then finally, um, if subsidence is uh, decreasing, uh, I'm looking at the question. I'm figuring out a way to, to ask it actually uh, from our from our guests. So, there and I know uh, their interest is specifically in Spring Creek and Cypress Creek. So, as subsidence is occurring, is that decreasing the ability for those creeks to flow? Uh, is there a gradient difference? Right? You, you see what my what what his question is? Yes. Um, I will say yes. Um, a lot of the H and H model results um, speak to that further, which I can't speak to much of that further. But I will say we do have our subsidence grid and the methodology of how that was created. That is available on our website. So if they're interested in the subsidence piece, um, that is available. Um, some of those additional H and H model pieces won't be released until Map Next is released. Um, but we do touch upon that. Yes. Okay, I see. And then finally, um, your map indicating that, that in essence, the areas around Katy and the woodlands are experiencing the greatest subsidence currently uh, up to that three quarters of an inch a year. What would be a correlation to some of the land use uh, uh, laws that are in effect, say, in Fort Bend and Waller County and, and the, the explosion of growth that we know is continuing in those areas on our west side of, of, of Harris County? Uh, and is that that's the correlation to those bigger dots that we saw on your graph? Yes. So the majority of the groundwater use in Area 3 is actually for public supply on the municipal side. Um, and as we see that Katy area is growing and more subdivisions are being built, um, that just increases it further. Um, I will say ag agricultural and industrial are very, very small. It's predominantly majority public use. Right. Okay. And so what does uh, the Harris Galveston subsidence district recommend? Um, and, and is there a relationship with those jurisdictions to try and, and discuss this? Yes. So we actually have in regulatory area three, a groundwater reduction plan is known as the GRP. Um, and certain permittees have this with us where they define how we can reduce groundwater use um, and steps that they can do to limit this. This is a long process. That's why we have those milestones, because planning does take a lot of time and, and money to be able to do. Um, so we are working through that as we continue to see these um, growth and, and ways that we can help the community still have water available to them, but in a way that doesn't impact the land surface as much. Makes sense. All right. Well, everyone, that was Ashley Gruder. We very much appreciate her joining us today for the symposium. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Great discussion, great information. Let's move on to Randy Chillette, the Executive Director of the Texas On-Site Wastewater Association. We're going to be talking next about coastal communities and OSSFs for a sustainable future. Again, OSSF is that on-site sewage facilities. Uh, so there's Obviously, we've been talking about the growth in our area, uh, concerns about public health, environmental health. We just discussed, you know, uh, the elevation of our land. Um, what are the, the these are we've been describing all these impacts of human development on our environment and OSSFs have a completely different way of, of handling than that massive distribution of water, collection of water and distribution of water through a city system. So, uh, Randy, welcome. Talk to us about what this difference is and, and why OSSFs are, are a, uh, a viable way of, of doing things a little bit differently. Thank you, Chris. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. You're good to go. Good. Just want to make sure. Uh, so, I've been in this industry now for a little over 30 years. Uh, started out uh, as a young man, uh, very connected 
to uh, the waters of, of Southeast Texas. Growing up in Bridge City, uh, we have a little bayou that runs through our little town called Cow Bayou. Uh, in its early days uh, of development here, it was uh, dredged out for uh, navigable, to be a navigable waterway. Uh, so you have the old original bayou that looks like a snake with a, a ditch that runs right down through the middle of it, which made it great for skiing as we were growing up and uh, water skiing, that is, and uh, uh, grew up doing that as well as uh, earning my, my living as a young uh, man, uh, shrimping. My father was a carpenter by trade, but uh, when he could make more money uh, dragging webbing or nets, as we called it, uh, than he could driving nails, that's what we did. So as opposed to having a paper route when I was a young man, I had a bait route. So I learned at, at an early age the, uh, the need for, for good, clean water for recreational use, of course, uh, for the water skiing and all that, but also for a food source. And, and so water uh, and coastal water is near and dear to my heart. Uh, later on, I got involved in, in the on-site industry. I like to joke about it. I went from one end of the food spectrum to the other, uh, from uh, uh, making my living uh, in the seafood industry, uh, shrimping, uh, to going into the on-site wastewater industry. Uh, uh, but like I said, very, very close and near and dear to, to the waters of Texas. And so uh, when I was asked to uh, get involved with presenting this, uh, it, it means a lot to me to introduce this to you guys. We have uh, uh, really major concerns with, with Texas is growing. We have a lot of uh, people coming in from, from a lot of other states as well as our own growth. Uh, concern for public health, environmental health, public safety, environmental uh, safety regarding surface, groundwater, and coastal waters of Texas are growing too. Development and the demand for on, on the environment and our infrastructure choices uh, we have in wastewater treatment and how on-site wastewater sewage facilities can be better sustainable uh, solution for much of Texas and the coast. And what I mean by that is in many of our coastal regions, especially along that Bolivar Peninsula, I lived in High Island for almost eight years as a young man. And uh, that region's been uh, inundated with, with storms between uh, Rita, Ike, Harvey. Uh, a lot of uh, new development is taking place in that area and putting a, a huge strain on the environment there. Uh, and so uh, uh, what types of systems we use for that development is critical to maintaining the environment and protecting that environment and public health. Uh, we've got uh, many uh, on-site uh, facilities uh, on that uh, Gulf Coast region, stretch of the Gulf Coast region, but there are some uh, municipal or community uh, package plants that many of the developers are having uh, issues with tying into because those uh, community sewer systems are already overloaded uh, or undersized for, for, for the development that's growing there now. And so what's happened in, in, in the recent past, there's been some legislative uh, uh, changes in the Galveston County District, uh, County uh, Health District, requesting that uh, the removal of uh, site uh, size limits. In other words, the, the state limits the size of a lot for an on-site sewage facility, depending on the capability of the soil handling the wastewater. And so uh, that limitates the, the ability to develop that property. So uh, these developers have been facing so much uh, uh, growth and uh, not being able to tie into a reliable uh, community source have, have seek uh, doing away with the, the lot size limits. That's fine as long as you're using proper technologies. But what we do uh, see in many cases, uh, unproven or older technologies being allowed to continue uh, being used. And so uh, as we get into this, we'll, we really want to uh, look at the alternate technologies today that are available uh, 
to be able to actually uh, bring our wastewater from being just disposed of to actually reusing that wastewater all the way back into the home. Uh, I want to thank you all for your time today and let's get into it. So future water demands uh, require action right now. Uh, a review of, of, of the data Texas specifically in the Houston region uh, and I'm not going to hash over. You've had a lot of good presenters. Uh, uh, Jason really uh, covered this well, as well as Dustin. And then uh, the, uh, Ashley just really covered a lot, of, a lot of this information. So we won't hash over this, but I just wanted to present this uh, so that we can move forward with, with what we're looking at. And so uh, this, uh, uh, put this, this thing out of my way a little bit so I can see a little better here. Uh, this particular uh, graph shows uh, that the water demand is growing and it's going to continue to grow. Uh, and, and so what we're looking at today, uh, right now currently, on-site sewage facilities uh, are about 25% of all wastewater treated in, in Texas. And, and that stands pretty true to this area as well. Uh, and the projected growth here in Houston area is uh, roughly uh, a 60 percent growth rate looking out all the way out to 2070. That's going to put a tremendous demand on our water supply. Uh, we have a finite amount of water. Uh, as you've heard, the, the surface water is predominantly uh, where we get most of our water from. Most of the water uses is our, our municipal uh, this graph shows, and you can see how high up it, it goes. The, the curve is, is pretty sharp. Uh, our, our growth is, is going to be significant. Uh, our water usage is actually going down a little bit per capita. And this data is from Texas Water Development Board. Uh, and it shows that our water usage data is, is coming down a little bit. And the reason for that is simply uh, water fixtures, water saving devices that we're implementing, we're using, utilizing those. But uh, for us to, to really uh, fully uh, have meaningful uh, conservation, we're gonna have to have a, a robust uh, beneficial reuse to offset much of our state's demand. So you can see the, the, the red uh, line going up here, it's it's a little slower than that than that growth curve, and that's because the 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 water usage demand per capita has gone down a little bit, even though our our population growth is going to continue to grow. One of the things I want to discuss today is is uh, our rural development and urban and recreational communities, much as I was talking about along that Bolivar Peninsula area, and many of those older uh, establishments and and many of our older communities throughout the Houston area and throughout the state as far as that goes, we see a lot of the older conventional site type technologies. These are uh, conventional septic tanks are typically called or septic tank and absorption fields. Uh, because of the tight compacted clay soils like uh, Ashley was talking about earlier, uh, in, in, in Southeast Texas, we do not have typically good suitable sandy soils except are on the beaches. And so the way a septic system works properly and the best is a happy medium. Uh, uh, not a soil with too much clay, not a soil with too much sand because we don't want to rapidly go down through the, the sand with untreated uh, effluent going right to our water tables, much like what we see uh, along our coastal regions. So these types of systems are not to be used and they're unreliable in our Gulf Coast area. And uh, the disposal methods that are used with these types of uh, conventional septic tanks are unreliable and not to be used in this area. What we do have today are advanced treatment units or uh, ATUs, aerobic treatment uh, units. And these are secondary wastewater treatment systems and they're typically in multiple tanks that provide water quality suitable for pool soils uh, or proximity to groundwater and used in this area. And this is what's been going on since our statewide rules in 1990. Uh, advanced systems have been taking off more and more. Uh, and we'll, we'll show some, some, some data to that effect here a little bit later on. 
uh, as I, I go through this. Uh, secondary treated effluent can be used for spray irrigation, and, and that is the, the, the traditional method right now is either surface spray irrigation or drip irrigation. Uh, drip irrigation line is usually put in uh, 6 to 12 inches below grade uh, and, and works very effectively in our areas. Although we do have some very small, tight uh, uh, lots like uh, what we're trying to utilize uh, in that uh, Bay Area and along the peninsula. But when you move further inland and you get into tight clay soils and you're trying to put a, a, an on-site system on a postage stamp uh, for a lot size, uh, it can be very difficult in these tighter clay soils. And so therefore uh, uh, using that water for other things besides just uh, irrigation is, is a major uh, issue that we need to be looking at and, and opportunity. A change from disposal to reuse is required for sustainability. Treatment and disposal of our most precious resource uh, is, is uh, at our forefront here. Uh, most wastewater treatment plants reuse only a portion of the irrigation uh, uh, for irrigation purposes. All municipal wastewater treatment plants direct discharge to a nearby ditch, bayou, river, or bay, eventually making it to the Texas Gulf Coast where I catch seafood from my family. Uh, and this is where it hits me really hard. Uh, going out and, and, and uh, dragging nets all my life since I was a young man all the way up to today, I uh, still do it for with my little outboard as you see here uh, along the Gulf Coast. And uh, you see everything that, 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 that that is disposed of. I've, I've known all my life that I've lived downstream from other folks growing up on uh, the convergence of where the Sabine River and the Natchez River dump into the Sabine Lake uh, tributaries and and uh, and that feeds into the Gulf. Uh, uh, what, what goes downstream we see and we, we get it. So uh, what I really would like to see uh, is us to get away from a mindset of disposal and direct discharge to reuse and land application. Uh, this is a paradigm shift to reuse uh, from what we are used to thinking and the way that uh, big pipe can learn from little pipe here, in my opinion. Uh, what we've learned in the on-site industry is the beneficial use of land application. You get nutrient removal. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're not removing from our wastewater. The nutrient is, is the biggest thing. Uh, uh, nitrates, phosphate, phosphates, and uh, pharmaceuticals. All of these things uh, can be filtered through the soil and prevented from uh, reaching our surface waters and groundwaters if we use land application and proper re reuse projects, uh, we are not utilizing uh, uh, the technologies that are available today uh, for, for reuse. Uh, I wanna share with you, and, and I know that some others have talked about the One Water Project. Uh, back in 2021 at our uh, uh, affiliate at NARA conference that we had in San Marcos, uh, Nick Dornack was able to present that uh, Wimberley School Project to our uh, installers and uh, site evaluators, designers, and, and uh, folks that are in our on-site industry to that concept, uh, this one water concept. So I'm just sharing this with you guys today. This is, uh, this is just a link to that one water project. She, she did a lot of better job of, of providing that information earlier. Uh, but uh, water OSSF reuse is a way to real water conservation. Uh, Texas A&M AgriLife uh, and Research Extension uh, has a feasibility study to evaluate on-site wastewater uh, for non-potable reuse. Uh, that is a that is a, a, a chart that shows the total nitrogen and BOD reductions in the non-MBR uh, system during the nitrogen study period. Note that 80% of the recirculation of the aerobic effluent 
into the trash tank decreased and significant reduction caused a, a negative effect with BOD reduction. So what that's basically telling us is that with more recirculation, and this is just a research project that proves the point that, that on-site wastewater technologies have the ability with just uh, increasing the, the recirculation of the effluent back to the trash tank, uh, we can produce uh, very low nutrient uh, uh, effluent uh, which uh, uh, even prior to going to soil disposal or where you have limited soil disposal or uh, uh, like in along that Gulf Coast region where you have sandy soil where that water is going to rapidly move through that sand and get to the water table. Uh, these types of technologies are available to allow that to happen and not uh, cause a detriment to the environment. Let's see move this a little bit further. So overall, the OSS requirements and ATUs, uh, there is a potential for to reduce the demand for fresh water supplies by millions of gallons per year. Uh, reuse of uh, treated wastewater for toilet and urinal flushing not being utilized very much yet, but this research will bring us uh, another step closer to a real water conservation. This, this uh, chart shows us the, the, the utilization of uh, spray irrigation versus uh, septic tank drain fields. Uh, when you look back in the early 90s, and this is from our ORS data, the best that we, we have from the state, TCQ provides this and A&M has put this in this graph. Uh, you can see where we're, we're rapidly, since the, the early 2000s, we're rapidly going back, going to more advanced wastewater treatment technologies as opposed to the uh, conventional drain field and septic tanks. The problem with that is it's, it, with your older conventional septic systems, especially along the Gulf Coast and along Cal Bayou here in our e region, I do not live in region H where, where we're talking about mostly. I live in uh, the, the Southeast Texas region I, but uh, it, it's right borders up against you. And I'm very familiar with the same type of uh, scenarios. We have uh, conventional septic tanks along our Cal Bayou system. And the way TCQ's uh, rules and, and the county's rules work, uh, unless that system fails and there's a complaint against an older system, or unless uh, that property gets sold and it gets caught up in permitting uh, uh, updates, then those older systems are still contributing to putting uh, untreated wastewater right into our uh, bayous and tributaries. Uh, the city of Galveston wastewater treatment plant uh, uh, is being utilized by Moody Gardens uh, for tertiary treatment of their water. Uh, we were able to uh, exploit this and show this to our members at our 2022 conference in Galveston. Uh, this particular overview is, is one that uh, it discharges uh, a million, it treats and discharges a million gallons of, of water a day to the golf courses and land application for uh, Moody Gardens. Uh, this is uh, the beginning of that uh, little outdoor tour that we did of those, uh, the wastewater treatment facility and the tertiary treatment facility that Dr. Lesker, one of our uh, uh, speakers uh, was presenting to the group. So we uh, took this trip and, and it, it was almost uh, like a bunch of kids in a candy store with the giddiness of the, the folks that were uh, getting to hear about this tertiary treatment for the first time and actually see uh, uh, this type of technology, even though it's being used in a large scale, that's exactly what we've done in on-site uh, over 30 years ago. We started taking uh, activated sludge processes and bringing them down into miniature uh, so that we could handle these uh, situations in our tight clay soils and, and get away from these old conventional septic systems that were uh, uh, contributing to uh, the degradation of our bayou streams and, and, and creeks from direct discharges or even off property discharges from these on-site systems. So this type of technology is uh, really exciting to our industry. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to get to introduce it to this these uh, individuals. Uh, 
a gentleman Ray here pictured in the center of this, this photograph was really excited to be able to uh, explain to us the processes and how he uh, treats uh, the, the wastewater coming from the, the treatment, uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, with the uh, micron diffusers uh, filtration system. These, uh, they start with uh, strain screener baskets and then they just keep working it down to smaller and smaller micron to membrane technology and reverse osmosis. Uh, this creates uh, uh, a water that's clean enough to be able to go back and use in their saltwater aquarium sand filter systems to backwash their sand filters with. Uh, and these uh, aquariums have uh, uh, very uh, uh, sensitive uh, wildlife in them, everything from uh, the penguins to the, to the uh, sea lions and, and you name it. Uh, and that water is good enough to use in their uh, system for filtration. Uh, uh, and it's also safe enough to use for their uh, watering and reuse in, in public uh, places for their uh, golf courses. So uh, when I grew up in the early 60s going across over to Louisiana, uh, my grandparents still had an outhouse out back that we used. Uh, all the men would go to the outhouse and women had the restroom in, in the in the home. Uh, for life, liberty, and happiness, I'm, I'm making a little joke here about it. On-site suits a sustainable future that allows communities to grow without negative impacts to public health and environment. From outhouses to advanced wastewater treatment systems at near 30% and growing, on-site and reuse are here to stay. Uh, this is not a joke. This is this is real. We have the opportunity to use this technology. Uh, when you when you think about uh, Moody Gardens utilizing a million gallons per day uh, with a uh, tertiary treatment facility off the back of a wastewater treatment system that the city owns, that just shows us if it's manageable and affordable for business to do. It's manageable and affordable for municipalities to do. And I would like to see uh, that uh, concept of, of, of reuse come to uh, full fruition with our municipalities as well uh, as we're doing with on-site and utilize on-site reuse for uh, way more than what we are right now. Currently the chapter 210 and chapter 285 allow reuse uh, in on-sites, but not to the extent that we know the technologies that are available today. I just really wanted to introduce that to this group. I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here as far as a lot of the uh, reuse uh, aspects. You guys are already doing a lot. And there's a, uh, a lot of people here that, that have a really uh, uh, good passion to, to get this done. And I believe we can. Uh, and I believe on-site is going to be a, a, a major part of that. So thank you, Chris, for, for allowing me to be here today. And thank you, Randy. Yeah, uh, there, we have several questions. Um, I'm going to ask first about the cost comparison of a, a facility using new technologies versus older systems. Clearly, there's going to be, you know, a cost difference. Time changes, and you know, everything gets more expensive as time goes on, right? But if we look at what the cost benefits are, is it? It, 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 if we got to a point where putting a facility like that on an individual site has become more cost effective as technology has improved. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, looking at, and, and I, I will be visiting with those developers down in Galveston County, along with uh, uh, some engineering firms and the health district down there to look at since they've changed their, their rules that take place actually September 1st of this year makes that available to, to Galveston County. So to make sure that those uh, new advanced technologies uh, are affordable to these developers as well as meets their needs and growing, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a balancing act that we have to look at and, and whether it needs to be, uh, you know, the infrastructure needs to be coming from uh, a, a municipality uh, or, a, or a group, a mud district, or, or, or whether it needs to be individual on sites, uh, that uh, there's a quilt work already in place. Uh, 
if you look at Harris County, uh, there's a lot of on-site systems that come right up almost into downtown area. And so uh, not only are, are on-sites available to, 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 for the outgrowing areas, but even in your uh, intertwined and intermixed areas of Harris County uh, and surrounding counties, uh, there's a lot of older on-site systems that could be uh, easily and affordably upgraded to the advanced systems and, and utilizing urinal flushing and toilet flushing to, to reduce the amount of water needs uh, by grade. Uh, as as your, your, many of your speakers have already stated, uh, surface water is our, is our major source. Municipalities are our major demand. And just by reusing uh, toilet flushing and reuse in our in buildings and, and like washing windows and and utilizing uh, reclaimed wastewater for irrigating our our esplanades and, and areas and, and parks and in, in the in the county uh, is going to tremendously reduce the demand uh, that's going to continue to grow. Right. Uh, what about any uh, in in the Houston Galveston area, any uh, success in constructed wetlands um, using, you know, there's 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 plants that remove different toxins uh, from the water. Oh, absolutely, and 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 for to to that extent, the the general land office is doing has started its study, you know, along the Gulf Coast, and it started right up here in, in Orange County, and I was able to be a part of that with uh, Lamar uh, students going out, showing them some locations, good location to be able to pull samples from. And there's going to be some areas of low income, like around that Vider area, just east of Beaumont, uh, along the Natures River. There's there's a good marshy area, and what we're looking at is 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 the possibility of developing some uh, uh, some of the coastal marshes there and putting some levee systems in with with specified outlet points so that we can you you know you're not going to be able to bring every older conventional system into compliance but if we can uh develop some constructed wetlands and utilize our our estuaries and marshes that we currently have as a buffer before it allows that wastewater to just untreated wastewater to just go right into our nature's river uh system that's what we're looking at doing and and so there there's absolutely uses for constructed wetlands in these areas where we uh we can use them for buffers. And I know there, there are some larger systems that can take uh, OSSFs and turn it into potable reuse, but is there opportunity to do that on a small scale, small enough? That Ab it could be absolutely, that's why we were presenting this, this large scale RO system. Uh, we're already experiencing and, and, and experimenting with uh, uh, ultraviolet, UV, uh, chlorination and uh, ozone and when you use the combination of those three, uh, you can really clean the water up along with RO. You can clean the water up well enough to bring it back into the home for, for toilet flushing and urinal flushing right. uh, or, or business, home or business at the on-site level. Uh, the technology's there. I don't think our, our, our rules and our mindset's quite there yet. People aren't quite ready for, for, for bringing wastewater back into our homes and businesses. But, but quite frankly, the technology's there and available. And, and quite affordable. frankly, there are examples already out there. You probably just don't know it yet. Absolutely. Well, Randy, and Harris thank County, you so much. Uh, yes, Harris County is doing a great job. I know some of the park systems back when John Blunt was the Harris County engineer and uh, Elisa Max both were part of those projects where they are using the Harris County park systems uh, are using uh, uh, on-site wastewater reuse in the in the toilet urinal flushings as uh, case studies right now. Exactly, excellent point, and and yeah, we need to learn from these examples. So. Uh, Randy, thanks again. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat that you might be able to just uh, answer on your keyboard. Um, someone looking for information about uh, future Moody Gardens tertiary tours, and then uh, what organization was doing that work out in um, in uh, over near uh, the Texas Louisiana border there. Uh, perhaps yes. you could just answer those in the chat. And uh, sure. very much appreciate you joining us for symposium today, Randy.
Thank you. We're going to take a really quick last bio break uh, and get right back to our presentations. Uh, once again, our sponsors are going to be showing some videos, uh, this time with uh, Harris County Pollution Control Services and also Tally Landscape Architects. So uh, let's uh, give our sponsors uh, their due and uh, we'll see you in just a few minutes. What does PCS do? The activities of the Pollution Control Services Department, PCS, are directed toward ensuring clean air and water for the citizens of Harris County consistent with the protection of public health, enjoyment of property and the protection of plant, animal, and marine life. As we look toward the future, our commitment to excellence continues to propel us to build solid, ground-down foundations today that will meet the evolving demands of tomorrow. As our population grows and land use needs change, we will continue to bring the most advanced, creative, and impactful visions to the communities we serve as we continue our mission of engineering the future. Hawes Hill & Associates, working with our local government clients for economic development, public safety, and so much more. All right, so let's jump into our last presentations for the day. First, welcome Juan Moya, who is a senior principal at Stantec and leads their coastal restoration practice. We'll be talking about the recent geologic evolution of Texas coastal hydric soils and their controls on wetlands and marshes. Uh, so Juan was a former project manager at the GLO, Texas Grand uh, General Land Office, and um, participate in the development of the Texas Coastal Sediment Geo Database. Uh, let's be talking now about soils and sediments and their importance for our wetlands and our marshes. Uh, there's one on the screen, I see him. Welcome, sir. Thank you, can you hear me? I can, a little bit low on that, so just speak a little bit louder and everyone will be good and you can share your screen with your presentation. Okay, thank you, let me. That sounds me... great. Can, can you see the presentation? 
quite yet. It'll probably be up in a second. Let me see what, what is happening, sorry. There we go, I think it's starting. Okay, thank you. Yep, ready to go. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, we are gonna talk about a little bit about geology uh, and geomorphology 101. Um, um, just a little bit of the introduction, of, you know, why we are picking this uh, this process uh, of this presentation. I'm a former uh, GLO coastal program manager. I was hired to look for sediment sources for restoration. I have been working in coastal restoration for 34 years. I have the privilege to participate in the GLO uh, Corporate Engineers EIS for the Coastal Texas Feasibility Study conducting the geological assumptions for Berry Islands and for some of the environmental restoration measures, and develop the databases uh, 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 for sediments and also some sediment management plans for ports, navigation channels, and some restoration projects. And what we're trying to apply here is the concept of natural sediment management for eco-geomorphological restoration. And we are talking about uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, I'm using the the concept that Stantec has in in the website before my time. But basically, the nature-based solution has had in the past different names. You know, engineering with nature, geomorphological engineering, eco-geomorphological designs. But basically, it's trying to use restoration efforts for marshes, wetlands, coastal shorelands to reduce risk for flooding and also impacts uh, due to sea level rise and natural disasters. But in these definitions, I never found in the definitions the, that they are mentioning the concept of natural sediment management. What that means is what if we keep the sediment in the system? You know, the sediments, the soil, et cetera, and we're gonna talk about it. I have the privilege of, of um, being a, mentored by Dr. John Anderson from Rice University on the geology. He helped us to build the sediment database that GL is using. And he came with this uh, analysis before his retirement, basically presenting that uh, the Texas coast, uh, when sea level rise was 200 feet below, 180 miles from Galveston offshore, um, the coast was there and we, the, the landscape used to be just deep valleys, deep channels, you know? And um, the uh, issue is that uh, we came from deep channels to a flat coast today and to flat plains. And also was confirmed by Bloom, uh, Mike Bloom came up with uh, this uh, reconstruction of the Paleo rivers that we used to have just two mega basins in the upper coast. And the sedimentary geology around the, the lower part of, including the coastal counties was exactly the same. That is the sedimentation that happens after sea level rise, uh, before sea level rise and after sea level rise. Is it more or less the same? So let's have some concepts uh, clear, you know, just go to the basics of geomorphology. Geomorph geomorphic features are the substrate of our ecological units. So it is you know, where the, the ecological, the plants get established in the soils, in the, in the channels, et cetera. Geomorphic system change. And the Texas geomorphic system changed dramatically in less than 10,000 years. And what John Anderson is telling us is uh, 10,000 years ago, our coastal plains used to be inside channels, basically came to a flat surface with uh, rivers, running on the plains, and then the base started to grow. But in terms of geomorphic system versus time, we have these uh, kind of events where we the, in time, our geomorphic system comes and gets impacted by a storm or by drought, but comes back to the same system. Also, we can have a system that gets impacted big time by a big event, maybe catastrophic uh, hurricane, tsunamis, whatever, right? and then the system takes a new direction. But there are cases when the uh, event is coming, a big catastrophic event or change comes and the systems start reversing. And we're gonna talk about this ex with examples. So Anderson 
I came and said, well, Galveston Bay used to be the big valley of, of the Trinity River and the San Jacinto River. And it started to get inundated a few thousand years ago, and the geologists call it QR, Quaternary Alluvium. Or, and the material that was, the pre-existing materials of the, on the place used to be, on the former place, Quaternary Pleistocene, Quaternary Boma for the local population. Then uh, from the inundation, after the inundation, we had the very islands basically that came and closed on and created the, um, the estuaries, the bays, and came with marshes on the oh sorry, uh, marshes with the inland inland marshes and back back in very island marshes. But once we have these very islands in place, we reset the clock, the geomorphologic clock, from being an open water, Gulf water. Now we have base. We started a new geomorphological clock for the base. So let's go and review this uh, uh, because we, the geologists, map QL, and now in base we see these paleo channels in the Copper Bay called QL with the mods of the base. Well, the same thing with with uh, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, where uh, uh, Anderson is telling us that the projection of the channels went up and the, the, these alluvions uh, are there, just covered by uh, Gulf water. To understand these processes, we need to go and, uh, and work on what is called a geomorphic analog. What, the, and, uh, a geomorphic analog is a kind of a geomorphic feature that is similar to other to the feature we want to study, but in another region that has similar evolutions, similar processes. And this, this is an example in the Colorado Plateau where this uh, uh, plain has been going uh, by, uh, controlled by vertical erosion for more than 60,000 years. That is more or less the time where these processes were happening. So that is how the, why we are gonna use this as a geomorphic analog. So we let's keep this in mind because we are going to use it several times. So we have an area, of Texas, where it was going on through undercutting, downcutting processes, an area that went to downcutting processes. In 2020, there was I was working on the sediment source for uh, in the Sabine Bank for Texas Point and uh, doing the assessments of the geology in, in the, the Sabine and. and uh, Trinity Rivers offshore, I found this paper, the Henrich, uh, Paul Henrich from the Louisiana Geological Survey, that is really a geological uh, masterpiece for me. In the last 10 years, it's one of the best papers that I have been. Oh, sorry. And Paul Henrich basically reconstructed for looking for sediment sources and the archeological location of potential uh, cultural resources um, where, how the, the coast started to get, how the sediments started to get deposited in the last 120,000 years with the ups and downs of sea level rise and the, the Bowman formation. This is offshore, about uh, 15 miles uh, offshore. And the Paleo Valley of, of the Trinity River with the terraces, the, the, uh, the sand, uh, sandy terraces that Geo is trying to kind of get the beach sediments for restoration in, in, in the Gulf. And he called this unit the uh, mods of the Mermat. And uh, basically, I, oh, this is pro uh, problematic when you have these uh, uh, mods because, uh, well, that is a, you need clean sand for the beaches. So I call him and I say, Paul, this is great. He explained a few things, but I ask him how we can project this geology inland because you this you have everything under control offshore. But how we can project this inland? And he said, you know, it's your job. I don't have the time. I'm doing something else. Go ahead. You I'll have fun. I say, oh, okay. Well, thank you. So I started to, to, to go more in the details of Mermato. Mermato is a town located uh, like a 40 miles from Lake Charles to the east, but 41 miles inland. And basically what happened is uh, in the 50s, they were installing some water wells and they, in the installation, they went um, and cut uh, um, some mods. They went through deep mods uh, a thick moths, basically, and they describe it the moths of Mermato. 
and that's it. They stay there. And then with time, the geologists started to see that these moths go all the way to the continental shelf. So um, basically what we have in Mermato is a Paleo Valley that were, got uh, filled by sea level rise and in, in recent time. So I started to say, well, uh, what would be the signal in terms of the landscape of these deposits? You know, this is the true definition of Mermato. So what I went is to, to the, the analysis of soils. And uh, the soils started to show this platform will be equivalent to this platform here. And I discovered bingo, if all this uh, soil horizon have a lot of what is called BTs, that is basically uh, clay translocation, you need thousands of years to create these uh, sub horizons in the BT classification of soils. BT1, BT2, BT3, but there are so in these columns in the soils, we have more than 50,000 years for the formation of these soils. And we go to the other soil, and bingo, we don't have a B. It's basically part of the material against the soil. So the, this is a big difference in the in the formation that this is. Well, it looks like this is the soil connected to Mermetor. So I started to look more and we, with the QAL model and with the valley of the Colorado and the Brass Rivers are classified as the new QAL, but we connect that the Columbia Boronland Forest is exactly located on the Paleo Valley of, of the, where these Mermato deposits. And I went to a bank, we went to with a, uh, doing a study for Fort Bend County, and this is what, look, we found the thick, uh, basically seals, valley field seals, and then the soils, where the soils of the uh, uh, Columbia Boronland Forest and we we kind of started to see that even the abulsions, these small channels here in the weather organic in the in the surface. So it looks like this is the signal in the Brazos Valley of the of Mermato. So they said, well, but that is just let's continue to looking for more or more. So this is the LIDAR image of, of Fort Bend County, and we go with our analog and we start to see these features all over. Same like in the, pre basically what we are discovering, these are fossil creeks that were active, going to undercurrent for a long time. But now the, the alluvial, the valley is higher. The base level is higher. They don't have to cut. So what they are doing? Well, they are flooding because they, they, now the base uh, level is too high uh, because it's a valley field. And now we have a different process for going to this, going down the undercurrent. Now we have these very shallow, so well, they flow. So uh, yesterday, Corey presented a, a nice uh, project on the Katy Prairie of uh, stream restoration. And before my time, Stantec also developed one of these. What is uh, calls me and my attention is the paradise of wetlands that Katy Prairie used to be in before the uh, land development. And uh, then we, we these projects tend to be a natural design as uh, uh, and by basically trying to recover the the floodplain, and we can see historically how the area started to change and how this project started to come with wetlands and sinuosities, etc. But Harvey came, and this is a photo immediately after Harvey that basically this project was holding the water in place. So what that is, a, a, I didn't go out of the, of the banks, basically stay in the restoration area. But the, this is important because these projects are being developed all over. And I think there is a value that the, these projects are holding the water. They are not flushing the water fast. And there is a reason why this is beneficial. Let's go to the next. So I went and analyzed the QL everywhere. I, well, it was these maps were developed in the 60s, the geological maps of, of the 70s of Texas. So Mermato was not relevant, was just everything that is new is QL. But we let's go to our matches. Let's use our analog and we go to these features and we see these features with Valley Field, Channel Field, and marshes today all over Texas. So we see this more as the, the hydrology has been modified in the upper basins of, of our coastal counties. 
that has been done also in the lower cost. So we can see that we don't see much of these features, but we started to see that these morphologies are compatible with the morphologies that were developed by incision, by vertical incision, just got filled with, with new soils, uh, fine materials and marshes. So I want to do more testing. Okay, can the soil tell us about what is Mermatog, what is valley field, channel field, and what is not? I started to go to different examples of soils all over the different base, and I put this as a best example. So it came in Maragorda Bay, um, we could have these uh, marshes and uh, four different kinds of soils. This with a little bit of marsh, this is a big area of marsh. And we started to see specific soils attached to the new uh, channel field. And the oil soils that we did BT, 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 it played translocations in the, the original plains. And this is the areas that were filled. So basically there is a signal in the soil for hydric soils. And Mermato, the channel field has specific conditions, no big horizon or very thin horizon organic. So, well, it's helping us to understand, but that, what is, so what? So I know now the soils. I know the the, the ages, the difference in ages. So yeah, there is a paleo landscape there with uh, old soils, a new landscape with new soils. Well, it's, I started to connect it with the, what is called the, the Bayhead Deltas of Texas. The Bayhead Deltas are, almost all our deltas in Texas are Bayhead Deltas. And there are examples in the, also in the Gulf, the majority of the Gulf Deltas are Bayhead Deltas. And these deltas basically start, are in Paleo Valleys. And the way that they uh, have started to, who are being affected is by the internal disintegration. You see big lakes, you know, uh, they lost land, salinity intrusion comes, and this is general to all the, the, the Bayhead Delta system, one of the most affected uh, areas in the Gulf of Mexico where we are losing marsh and wetlands in the Bayhead Deltas. So basically they disappear because there is a process that is called backstepping Bayhead Deltas where they basically disintegrate in the pack and then they jump. And they jump back in miles, in terms of miles, two miles, three miles. They don't, it doesn't matter how much shoreline erosion they are having, but they they disintegrate and jump back. That's why it's called backstepping. Oh, so uh the the what we discovered is in many of these marshes connected to the base immediately, that they are getting disintegrated just as how the bay head deltas, no difference. They are disintegr disintegrating internally, and they are basically micro bayhead deltas. So uh, this is where I'm proposing the name of these basically mermato marshes, because these are very clearly connected to these paleo valleys, paleo channels, etc. And they came on top, but they are in the process of acting as bayhead deltas. So, but how that connects to our watersheds? Um, let's 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 do the connection. So the this is Mission Bay with Mission River during Harvey, and we can see how much the inundation came on the, on on Harvey. Basically, the the wetlands were keeping the flooding in the Pele Valley. So, but a lot of sediment was lost, was basically washed from the area and went directly to the bay. And we can see that in every single area, how many of these basically are losing sediments naturally by, by different processes. So these micro bayhead deltas, uh, just they're, they're, it's their nature to get disintegrated. So it's not related to shoreland retreat, like we believe we sometimes put our nature-based solution as uh, living shorelands in the front. And um, they may these actions may help, but they are being this disintegrated in the central, in the back side of, of the watershed. So there is an then a misconception that we we understand here that much disintegration is connected to base shoreland retreat. It's not, it's just one factor. These marshes have limited watershed sediment supply. There is no renewable sediment coming because they are disconnected in the upper part. You can see there is no more sediment coming. These are uh, fast watershed flushing for flow controls, basically washes the soil. So when we put 
projects that just want to get the water out for flow control and fast flows will wash the soil. So we'll wash the sediment. Salinity intrusion also are being, is being a factor. Relative sea level rise is also inundated these marshes. But we see the large storms are also washing the soaks. So this is kind of all the processes that are affecting the, this, well, what I call it, uh, mermental marshes. And basically this is a, this picture is telling us a lot, a big story. Well, we have the evolution of our course going through deep channels as uh, John Anderson told us. There is a, a, a channel field, valley field that will happen after sea level rise that filled all these valleys. But not all the these paleo valleys are the same. This is uh, talking about geomorphic clocks. This is more or less the same evolution of the base, but the marshes and the wetlands of Karankawa, uh, Karankawa Bay, they are already gone. So this is in a faster rate of evolution or disintegration that is Mission Bay. So we still have wetlands. With the wetlands in, in Karankawa, where they are far inland, the main problem here is when you have storm surges, the storm surges penetrate more inland when these marshes become the barrier, the, land, the natural line of defense for these storm surges. And it's the same for all, across the, all the Texas base. So marshes and wetlands act as the first line of defense. And what, what we see here is also the sediment that comes is being washed in the, in the systems naturally. We can see all the sedimentation and, uh, that coming in this basin is in, uh, stay internally in Karankawa Bay. And we can see how the evolution of these clocks, your morphological clocks that we are talking about, you see the morphology, they follow similar patterns. This rounded bay, this rounded bay, turns around, turns around. So it's very typical of what used to be the, the downcoding process before when sea level started to drop. And then the feeling uh, with valley field and channel field when sea level came back. So uh, mermatol deposits are very organic and thick in some areas. So when we have these big storms and we see all these sediments coming, a big amount of sediment that you see being washed out, out to the Gulf. It's basically in the soil area, in the organics, in the what is exposed directly to the base, to the sun surge. And it's basically, many of these areas are basically mermato marshes and mermato wetlands that we don't know much about it. So my, what I was trying here to put is in perspective, the geology, how geology really is connected. We is connected to our sediment sources offshore uh, because uh, the, the, all of the agencies are looking for sands in the 20, 10, 20 miles offshore across the Gulf of Mexico uh, for coastal restoration and beach nourishment. And the, the, but the geology also is projected inland and uh, but we can see the coastal marshes, wetlands, the Columbia bottleland forest, uh, and other ecological morphological units are on top of what we uh, are discovering is the Mermento allo formation. And uh, it's allo formation because it's called uh, in geology it's a regional depositional feature. And many types of coastal hydric salts also are part of the Mermento allo formation. And we don't know much about it. This is a kind of I started to, to put this together two, two years ago. I started to read what is available and I am not finding this connection between geomorphology salts and memato. Uh, memato is for groundwater issues, has been described, but not for other purposes. And now for sediment sources option. Uh, it looks like we have memato marshes and memato wetlands if we want to accept the term. But we don't know much about it as well, you know. And one issue that we can see in these photos is that flushing our watersheds with fast flows will continue to wash our marshes. And nature-based solutions in coastal watersheds should include sediment harvesting processes, but basically natural sediment management. We, if we can keep the sediment, the soil in place as part of our with these hydrological flow control measures. I think we are helping the, the, the natural system. And Mermato marshes are getting disintegrated as micro bayhead deltas. This is new to me. I, I, I was trying to read this in other paper. I haven't found, I didn't find any uh, reference on that. 
So this is also new to me. And Mars restoration efforts should start in the upper watershed, not only on the Bay Shoreline. So marshes are basically the end of our wetland system. It's a, everything starts in the watershed. And so we uh, a full watershed approach should be always considered how my uh, uh, flood control measures are going to affect my low, lower basin wetlands and marshes. And basically, ecogeomorphological solutions, if we put this information all together, it starts by understanding the substrates with where our ecological system became established. So soils are the substrate. Mermato creates soils and is the substrate of our ecological units. And my conclusion for all of this is that we are not losing coastal marshes and wetlands. I think we are losing their substrate. Once we lost the substrate, the soil, the hydric soil, basically we, they don't come back. So uh, that is, I hope uh, this short presentation, you know, uh, kind of help us to understand the role of the recent geology in the distribution of marshes and wetlands. Thank you. Well, that was fascinating. Um, really interesting to understand that the uh, the law where the loss of soil is actually occurring, and and really, so your message and the punchline is that the these rapid flows that development causes, if we're not handling that off flows in in a responsible, more um, sustainable way, is going to continue that erosion. Correct. We are washing the nutrients. We are washing the substrate of the marshes and wetlands. Yeah. Uh, in the interest of time, I want to get to our next presenter. I hope you can uh, address. There was a couple of questions in the chat um, that uh, you would be better possibly to just type in some answers, and we can get our final question, our final uh, presenter done, and uh, get out of here at our scheduled noon time. But one, thank you so much for attending today, and uh, all of that information very understandable and uh, really important for us to, to know. Uh, again, another one of those uh, indicators of our environmental health and, and how we are dealing with our land. Let's get to our final presenter. I'd like to introduce Emily Brown, uh, who is a water resource specialist with the City of Phoenix Water Services Department. Uh, she's gonna be talking about voluntary conservation for durable collective community action. And it's a Phoenix perspective. I uh, always enjoy bringing in other cities, uh, especially large ones across the United States, so that we can learn possibly from what has occurred there. Um, we've got to be adapting here in Houston. Uh, if In Phoenix, there's already this uh, water stewardship priority uh, that has occurred for quite a while, and it, it's created a culture of conservation in their city. So I really wanted to bring in uh, Emily to, to understand more about how those solutions uh, have affected their community and how those might be shared in in what we have is a fairly similar climate, maybe not as uh, dry as theirs, uh, but certainly as warm lately. Uh, so welcome, Emily Brown from uh, City of Phoenix. I see you on screen. If you get yourself unmuted. Hey, can you guys hear me? There, I can hear you just fine. Thank you. All right. And you're ready to share your screen and you are off and running. All right, we might have to fiddle with it for a minute. Okay. I think we're seeing your whole presentation there. Are we. I see yeah. that. Close. Hold on. We're close. Um. All right, one minute. I'm not sharing anything right now. Let's try again. Okay, are you seeing the, the right one now? That is what you're looking for, yes. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. And um, thank you to everyone for listening in. I just want to share my personal appreciation for the opportunity to speak to you all today and also say thank you on behalf of our entire water team for your interest in hearing our story and your willingness to include us in this dialogue. Uh, my name is Emily Brown. I'm a water conservation specialist in the Water Department's conservation team, 
In this presentation, I will be discussing our approach to voluntary water conservation and our goal of achieving durable collective community action. And I'm gonna to try to do this fast, um, but first we have to get some context. So I wanna start off by covering the main goals of the presentation today, because I'm going to try to fill some Phoenix background gaps uh, pretty quickly. So we'll start by going through some basic context about Phoenix's water situation. Then we will discuss our core water conservation strategies and introduce you to our conservation community. Next, we'll consider the importance of knowing your community of service, and I will share my recommendations for how to accomplish that goal. Then we will discuss growth opportunities and review an example of how recently we did that. Um, and finally, I wanna leave time to hear from all of you if possible. So I've had the pleasure of listening to some of the other presentations during the symposium, though I've missed some of the mornings due to uh, time differences. But I've heard enough to know that part of this presentation is going to be me uh, preaching to the choir. So especially after hearing Grant's presentation this morning, I'm going to be repeating some of the same concepts that have already been stated by the very environmentally and socially sensitive presenters and attendees in this symposium because this symposium is already very devoted to engagement and community inclusivity by nature of the BPA's work itself. So with that in mind, um, I hope my presentation today does not come across as offensive, but that it rather serves as an affirmation that you are thinking about things in the best ways and that your friends in Phoenix are thinking about socio-environmental challenges in the same way. Um, I hope that my examples and insights about the ways that we have implemented these principles might offer some new ideas about how we can amplify our missions through diverse partnerships and holistic methods of governance. So diving in now to that background information, um, you've probably heard about us recently, but we're located in the Colorado River Basin. As you can see on this slide, uh, the basin is huge. It actually covers seven states. Those are Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. Uh, the basin also provides water to 30 indigenous communities, two countries being the US and Mexico, and an estimated uh, 40 million plus people. So some climate context now. In the basin, we're experiencing regional drought and regional shortage. I'll be making various distinctions about regional and local water supplies. So just remember that the basin, the Colorado River Basin is regional. Drought is defined as an extended period of below average precipitation. Um, drought is purely abiotic, meaning that it is driven by environmental conditions like weather, time, and natural cycles of our environment and not humans. Shortages, however, are both biotic and abiotic. A shortage occurs when the demand for water is greater than the current supply. And our current shortage recently is being caused by humans and environmental factors. Um, so in the basin on a regional scale, we're experiencing some of the driest conditions in over 1200 years. We know this because of geologic data. Um, because of this, there are lower flows overall. And Phoenix expects to receive less Colorado River water because of these conditions. Moving into water governance, um, the federal government is the highest level of governance that impacts regional water management in the basin. The agency we focus on most is the Bureau of Reclamation because they manage the operations of dams and reservoirs like Lake Mead and Lake Powell. Their role is to balance safe dam operations, power generation, and human health and safety. So it's a huge bite. Um, Whoops. Okay, next, the Arizona Department of Water Resources implements the state's Groundwater Management Act. Um, this is an act that was passed in 1980. And they're also involved in surface water allocation. Last, uh, individual water users like Phoenix get water from a provider like the Central Arizona Project or CAP. Uh, water users are not just cities, but can also be industries like agriculture and mining or tribal communities. So all three levels of government are at play, basically. So next, who is Phoenix Water? Um, we are a public water utility that serves the city of Phoenix and some neighbor communities. We provide clean, safe, and reliable drinking water and wastewater services. Additionally, we are a steward of water resources. As a provider of water, we are also constantly thinking about water availability. 
Cleaning and stewardship are of equal importance in our work at the water department. We must first ensure that there's water available before we can treat and deliver it to the community. We are also a member of the community. I like to remind folks that we live in Phoenix too and we care just as much as residents do about the success and wellness of this community because we are also local. Finally, we are part of the institution that is the city of Phoenix. We are public servants for our community. And this photo here has some pretty cool people. Um, this was taken in spring this year at the annual volunteer award ceremony that is hosted by the city. Our adult volunteer program, the Phoenix Water Wranglers received an award for their work and their dedication to serving the city. So I'm here in the photo because I am the top wrangler and two of our volunteers, Teresa and John are here accepting the award on behalf of the group. On the left is our city manager, Mr. Jeff Barton. On my left is Cynthia Campbell, our water resources management advisor. And on my right is our mayor, Mayor Kate Gallego. So next, what does Phoenix Water do? Um, we're almost through the background now. Our vision is that we will provide superior water services while perpetuating environmental excellence and focusing on safety. Our mission is to provide high quality, reliable, and cost-effective water services that meet public needs and maintain public support. Bottom line, our mission is to serve the city of Phoenix and its residents by responsibly managing water resources for the overall resilience of our city. We serve the 1.6 million plus residents of Phoenix and some neighboring communities. Um, in this picture, that's our conservation team. We're tasked with achieving efficient and responsible water use for all throughout the city of Phoenix service area. So now on to um, our water portfolio. Where's our water coming from? This picture is actually the Four Peaks Wilderness. Um, on the other side of those mountains would be the Roosevelt Lake Reservoir. Um, that is the biggest reservoir on the local Salt River system. So 40% uh, of our water is the Colorado River water. So that is a regional water supply. 58% is our local water supply. That is the Salt and Verde Rivers. And only 2% is supplementary groundwater. So 98% of our water portfolio is renewable surface water. We actually manage our groundwater as a finite non-renewable resource. We use very little of it and practice water banking and recharge. We store extra water in our aquifers for a time when we may not have the option to rely on surface water. Um, Phoenix is located in the Salt River Valley. This is a valley in which many smaller rivers join together and then flow west towards the Gila River. Um, I'm gonna try to switch to my little pointer here. Okay, so here's Phoenix, kind of in the middle. Um, and then right underneath us, we have the salt coming down and then joining the Gila. You can see it says Gila right there. And it's gonna head all the way west to join the Colorado River in the bottom corner and then go into this uh, part of the ocean, that's the Sea of Cortez. So turning off my pointer, um, let's see. Next, we're gonna be talking about the core strategies of Phoenix's conservation community. So onto our culture of conservation, Phoenix is located in a desert and that's the Sonoran Desert specifically. Living here means that we must prioritize efficiency but we don't simply just want to survive here, we want to thrive here. Um, our water is precious and we know that a resilient community is only possible when there is a collective goal of efficient and responsible water use. So some quick uh, Phoenix vocab, we have the desert mindset. This means that we are embracing our landscape and our climate, respecting water as a precious resource, finding opportunities and aridity, and it is not a scarcity mindset or a persecution complex. Next, we have the desert lifestyle. This is making the choice to use water efficiently and responsibly, as well as planning ahead and saving for later, because conservation is simply the preservation of a resource for future use. Next, we have the water conservation community. These are the people who live the desert lifestyle and help others to adopt the desert mindset. And finally, we have the culture of conservation. This is what happens when everybody has an attitude where water is always used efficiently and responsibly. So moving on to the desert mindset in a changing world. Uh, this picture, by the way, is the little Colorado River um, and the Grand Falls.
very brown and pretty. Okay, so drought is a way of life in the desert. And um, we know this because we have cyclical droughts. They kind of happen back to back. Um, so this is something that we've accepted basically. Um, because of this, we build dams and reservoirs because we're either dealing with having too little water or too much. It's never like quite right. And when you have your dams and reservoirs, you hold water for when you need it. But what we're dealing with right now is actually drought and a changing climate. So this means that conservation is more important than ever. So a little information um, about Phoenix and the way that we manage water supply and water demand. It's important to note that conservation is not our only strategy. Um, so I want to briefly talk about supply management, though that's not my uh, field of expertise. To build in resiliency when managing our water supply portfolio, we focus on diverse supplies and methods. In order to design for adaptability, we are diversifying and embracing alternatives. This also means that we are working to ensure that we have adequate supplies, strong infrastructure, and flexibility. One example of this is our investigation and interest in advanced water purification. AWP is a method of treating wastewater effluent to such a degree that it would be safe for human consumption. Um, finally, we are always planning. We focus on the importance of modeling and practice preventative maintenance by updating treatment and delivery infrastructure before it breaks. So on to demand management. Um, again, conservation is not the only demand management strategy, but it's the one that I know best. Uh, the City of Phoenix implements many programs to meet the water conservation needs of very different audiences. We're considering every option as we develop our response to water supply variability in dynamic conditions. We're looking to balance community quality of life, revenue for operating the city and continuing to provide service, and equitable access to water. We prioritize sustainability and resiliency, human health and safety, and ecosystem health. This means that we might be sacrificing discretionary water uses like grass, ornamental landscape, or even excessive watering. Um, we also compromise and use greater caution. We plan through adaptation and allow ourselves to be flexible and embrace alternatives. So our recipe for conservation success we believe that successful conservation has broad community implementation, and this broad conservation would be voluntary, collective, and action-based. So talking more about voluntary conservation, I want to ask, what's our natural reaction to a rule? You guys are from Texas, we're from Arizona. None of us like rules, really. What are we going to say if you tell us how to do something? We're going to say, I'm going to do it however I want, actually. Um, so we believe that by pairing ed education and motivation and that feeling of inclusion, <coughs> um, we have uh, this more voluntary type of conservation. And then back to the rules, well, the opposite is choice. And the power of choice when somebody gets to choose to do something it makes it last for a long time and it makes it important. Next, we have um, collective conservation. So the scale of our challenge demands broad participation. Um, it's a big city and a lot of us need to work together. Finally, we have the strength of social memory or the weakness of its absence. Um, we have had a lot of population growth in the last 50 years. This means that um, there's probably some disconnect between residents and the city itself. So what do we do if there's a lack of shared identity in the community? Um, we have to be working constantly to rebuild that and make sure that conservation is something for everybody. And also there's the power of peer pressure or rather the desire to be a part of something. Um, last, we have action-based conservation. This means that a person just by themselves can be a part of the solution. Um, they know that their small contributions are really moving us towards that greater goal. And we have evidence actually that this is true. Um, also, we know that education and awareness are just not enough. People won't choose to conserve just because they have the context. They need a, a roadmap. Moving on to knowing your community of service. Um, so I specialize in community outreach and education. Um, we basically are only facilitating conservation. We're not doing it. 
We're just making it possible for other people by lowering barriers. So the first step would be building relationships and trust through our communications. We also practice outreach by maintaining a physical presence in the community. Um, we actually listen to our community through the practice of engagement, and we give community members a space to share their worries, needs, and opinions. We collaborate with community members and governing bodies, businesses, and nonprofits to grow the impact of our shared mission. And we help to lower barriers by teaching, demonstrating, providing assistance, and sharing with members of the community. Finally, once we've done all those other things, we believe we've developed a base for them to listen and understand the call to action. And when we deliver the call to action, we pair it with a relevant solution that they will actually be able to implement themselves. Um, last, we listen. That is the most important thing. If our mission is to save water, we need to have many actionable solutions that are relevant to the lives of the members of our community. All right, and then next we're considering growth opportunities because we know that if we want change, we need to make it easy. We know that change occurs when instructions are simple and clear and that actionable solutions identify the necessary tools, provide the ne minimum necessary amount of information and consider common barriers and address them. Uh, positive change or growth will come when we have listened to our community, understood their needs, and offered a solution that they can realistically implement. Community-wide conservation is not something that we can do by ourselves. That's not something that Phoenix employees are able to pull off. Our role is to make conservation an easy choice for everybody in our community. So one example um, is this project. This QR code will take you to the website where you can see these brand new resources. Um, we developed these in collaboration with ASU. Um, there's three different ones, just flicking through really quick and moving on to the context. So we had these resources before. Um, these are the results of about 30 years of work prior to um, me joining the team because we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, this resource you can find at phoenix.gov slash watercloud and there's that QR code from before if you weren't able to catch it. Um, this one has our step-by-step -step guide to watering efficiently, but it's 18 pages and it's a lot of math. Um, next, we have the zero escape guidelines, which will help you develop a beautiful zero escape yard, but it's 70 pages and a lot of work. Next, we have our plant selection. Uh, this is 200 plus drought tolerant plants, but again, really long, too many choices. Um, these show that there's a lot of work that's been put into conservation so far, but we don't know that they were really closing any gaps and creating that actionable solution. So our goal was to answer the most important um, and most common questions we heard, which were, where do I put the plants in my yard? How do I choose plants? Will I even be able to find the ones that I want? Can I design my irrigation system to be more efficient? And when do I water and how much should I use? Because what do my plants actually need? So in this resource, um, if you open it up, you would see that we have shown where to place plants um, and they've been placed to maximize space and the aesthetic benefits. We've given this plant selection guide. We have um, the maximum size, uh, whether they flower or they benefit pollinators. All of the plants in this plan were actually observed for sale. So we know that people can get these plants. They're not just a random drought tolerant plant. And most of them are native to the Sonoran Desert. Last, we have our watering guidelines that share when to water, where to water, and how much water to use. We also have shown where to place the drip emitters and what specs those emitters would have. In summary, Water conservation is the legacy of our community. As you can see, this is a very old picture. And if you read what it says on the back of the van, it says water conservation. Um, and it's the city of Phoenix's water conservation team. So as our community evolves, we're continuing to provide support by listening. And then if we have any time left, I want to listen to your questions um, and say thank you. And then also I have this reading list we can share with you later um, to talk about things I've been reading and uh, they might be useful for you guys if you thought this was a good presentation. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Emily. Uh, the 
for me, one of the things that stuck out, you and I'm going to quote you here, you, I hope I'm quoting right, you said respecting our desert and respecting our climate. Um, I, that, that suggests an understanding of, look, this is where we live, this is the conditions that are always going to be here, and then we have these evolving things with climate change. I think that mantra, if we were passed on to the Houston Gulf Coast area, would be something like, we need to respect the fact that this is a coastal wetland area, it's a grassy area originally, and then we move farther north and we have our woodlands areas. Um, not sure that our development trends are necessarily respecting that. What we should probably be thinking about is how to, we've been talking a lot about that in the symposium, how do we restore those conditions and still have growth at the same time. So it seems like that is the foundation of what y'all's efforts have been is understanding who you are all the time and and then how can we continue growth with the limited resources we have. Have I got that? Yes, thank you. I was about to chat something because I was frozen in mute world. Um, yes, you are spot on, Chris. We are just always focused on realigning ourselves to who our community is because there is that turnover and you know we don't have quite as much um climate variability as you guys do in such a large region but we do have so many new people that we need to meet all the time and understand their priorities any idea what y'all's growth rate is in comparison to us we've been hearing about you know different metrics but basically we're going to be doubling in population in the next 30 years what is phoenix yeah. I don't know. I don't know offhand. Um, I'm sure if you Google it, there would be something really quick. I should check that. But um, yeah, we're the fifth largest city in the country now. And it seems like oh, wow. I see an out-of-state license plate every five minutes. So we've got a lot of people moving here and we need to get to know them. And so do you think that the, uh, the, the efforts that you already have in place, are those going to be sufficient enough to sustain that kind of growth? Or are you already looking at other ways, other programs that you're going to have to institute? Yeah, well, from a, a planning perspective, we have ensured that anybody who moves here, or any projected growth would be, um, they would have water supply because we have a hundred year water supply. But as far as like actually knowing people, we have a lot more work to do. We're developing more stakeholder surveying efforts and working with ASU and trying to figure out what water saving solutions um, will actually resonate for everybody and what is actually useful for them. And then, so there's a question from one of our guests about wastewater uh, being able to be treated to a clean enough level for potable use. Are individuals, businesses, uh, working towards that goal, uh, and is the is the municipality kind of spearheading that? Yeah, so we would be spearheading it. We are working with other uh, neighbor cities, so it's kind of a collective effort. Um, we, you know, just recently actually developed the regulatory ability to do that. Our state agency, um, ADEQ, Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, actually had to pass state legislation that allows us to do that. So now that we've got that taken care of, we're going to be working on building the infrastructure and um, we will apply for a lot of grants to do that. And um, there's even Scottsdale is making a AWP beer and they're trying to get uh, everybody on board. Right. Mm -hmm. And so finally, and I think this is uh, another parallel between our, our two areas is you know, the, the Colorado River serves, as you indicated, multiple countries, <laughs> not yeah. just multiple cities and everything. Um, talk a little bit about how much uh, Phoenix has had to work with other cities in the state and neighboring states, just as we have had to work with neighboring counties, um, not so much other states, but, you know, much larger area of neighboring counties. Uh, and, and yesterday, you know, we talked about being downstream from Fort Worth uh, with the Trinity River, but um, what are you having to do and, and how is the tug and pull between all these jurisdictions to get these limited water resources? Yeah, so this is really a long game. It's been going on for over 100 years, um, very longstanding uh, agreements between states and water users and tribal communities and industries. 
With that in mind, um, we developed the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association with our neighbor cities in the valley. Um, you can look that up, it's AMWA. Um, they have prolific resources to read about online. Basically, the purpose of that organization is our united front in Arizona as the big municipalities. We're all working together to make sure that everybody is going to have enough water um, for our safe community future. Um, working with other states, I can't really speak to that because we're strictly on the local level here. Um, we have other water experts in the city who do work with other states and work with our state level of government. Um, it's just up the chain and everybody working in slightly different ways. There's different uh, water user meetings that happen every year, and there's always negotiations, visits to um, the state capital and any given state. And yes, everybody's doing their best to work together and trying to be patient with the changing situation. Great. Well, thank you for all of that and for the perspective of a uh, another growing jurisdiction in in our country. And I uh, did have a question or a request to post some of those uh, links that you mentioned. Uh, we did record this, obviously, and we will uh, get a way to uh, post all those great links that, that uh, you gave us. We'll probably have to do that on our website. But um, thank you so much for joining us uh, from a few states away. Uh, and for your information, really appreciate it. We can learn a lot from each other. And I hope that uh, if we can be a resource to you, uh, that you will look us up and let's continue our relationship. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I really enjoyed talking with everybody. Thanks so much, Emily. So with that, uh, I would like to ask uh, Brittany Flowers to turn on her camera and join me for these last couple of minutes uh, while she's doing that. Um, please don't forget about this afternoon's networking mixer. Uh, which is at Riverhouse Houston. Uh, it's going to be from four to seven this afternoon and is free for all of the attendees to our symposium. We've got drinks and some wonderful food for you at 65 Hirsch Road, Suite 100. That's again, Riverhouse Houston. Uh, so we'll hope that you will uh, join us and uh, you can talk to some of our presenters who will be there and uh, board members from Fire Preservation. And uh, I will be there and Brittany is going to be there, right? I I'll be there. All right. Well, good to see you. And I just wanted to end our our uh, uh, symposium this year uh, by introducing you once again to all of our guests. Uh, Brittany Flowers is our president and CEO and uh, give you the opportunity to kind of reflect quickly on what you've seen the last two days. You know, what what hit you the most of, of these presentations? Yes. Well, thank you, Chris, as always, for your wonderful uh, job doing uh, the MC and all the participation that you share as we get this uh, event organized. I want to thank everyone for sticking on a little bit after our uh, stated closing time. And on behalf of staff and the board, uh, thank all those who sponsored, attend, showed up to our field visit and who will be visiting us uh, this afternoon. Um, as for the presentations, I mean, I'm just blown away over the last two days. So many innovative approaches, so many um, ideas that are trying to reinforce the sustainability and resiliency plans and uh, needs that have been identified by uh, the, many of our partners from HARC uh, to, to Bayou Preservation uh, participating in many of those stakeholder discussions. So, um, but specifically, I really appreciated Emily's presentation, um, the amount of outreach that they are undertaking to have a collective impact in uh, their water resources and uh, their resiliency efforts, in, especially in that climate of Phoenix, it's it's really amazing. And I hope that we have the opportunity to engage with uh, not only the city of Phoenix, but all of the representatives that have showed up over the last two days. Um, and I think too, the work that the precincts are doing, you know, trying to advance county initiatives uh, with such a wide swath of our population living amongst our, our lowlands, our uplands, uh, along our, our coastal areas. It, it's a challenge and seeing the effort and uh, training and planning and outreach that these counties are taking, the partnerships that they're working with private and public sector, it's really inspiring and it's providing me with a lot of energy uh, and excitement about the work that we can accomplish. Um, having so many 
new folks, uh, Giselle from um, Harris County Flood Control, just hearing what he's thinking about coming from the Pacific Northwest was really invigorating. So uh, just so much great information. I think, you know, over the last 20 years, our symposium has been able to produce really great initiatives and bring folks together for partnerships and collaboration. And this year was nothing short of that. I agree with you, and uh, I think on that note, we'll hope that everyone joins us for our next symposium. Uh, stay tuned for uh, that announcement, and uh, please everyone head to the biopreservation.org website for more information about our group, what we do, what we have been doing, and uh, we will be posting the recording of these last two days of presentations uh, on that website. and. Uh, thank you all so much for your participation and joining us on our uh, journey. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, get to your lunch hour. We're adjourned. <laughs>